Zoom, but okay. Um, and my name is Lauren Fondal. I'm the biosolids coordinator at EPA, and also uh, the uh, one of the co-chairs of the CBA uh, planning committee. And uh, this morning, uh, this is the second day uh, of this conference, and uh, we'll have all the uh, PowerPoints up. Uh, and then also uh, people's bios on EPA's website uh, tomorrow. Um, it's at uh, epa.gov uh, slash CA slash California Bio um, Resources Alliance Symposia. In, uh, and um, our uh, introductory uh, um, remarks and then first speaker, uh, first moderator today is uh, Dan Noble. and. Uh, Dan has been a co-chair of this uh, for many years now, and he's also the head of the Association of Compost Producers and has several other activities, but um, I'll turn it over to Dan. Thank you very much, Lauren. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a context presentation as an introduction, not only to uh, today's um, day, but also um, pretty much from previous uh, for yesterday as well, because we, we wrapped up yesterday with uh, a lot of concepts that have been emerging in the industry. So um, I, I wanted to just state since the theme of the conference this year is developing the circular bioresources economy in California, what does that mean and how is the bioresources economy uh, um, related to everything that we're doing here in this symposium? Um, most people know, you know, linear versus circular and CalRecycle is adopting the notion of a circular economy as an extension of recycling. And um, so, Yeah, so next slide. Yeah, thank you. That's, this is kind of just the simple uh, cartoon of the circular economy, the take, make, use, dispose, pollute versus uh, recycle, make, use, reuse, remake. A more elaborate diagram of this economy, uh, economic model done by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is um, sometimes this is referred to by an environmental uh, economists as uh, the butterfly economy because it has two wings. And you'll notice that this is colored appropriately for the green side, which is the bioresources or the biological nutrients wing versus the technical or geonutrients wing. And you notice that they're colored just like the green bin and the blue bin because that's where the recycling happens. Although it happens not just in the bins, it happens everywhere in the environment. Um, I've made a little bit more of a detailed model of this relative to just the bioresource wing. And uh, I'm following some conventions that are developing in Europe where they refer to the primary bioresources as the whole ag industry. Down at the bottom there, you can see that picture, um, that designation. And then our part of the bioresources industry, the recycling of it is, um, is you know referred to sometimes as the secondary bioresources. So, and that in statute, that's really organic waste or organic residuals, or what we often simply call feedstocks. Um, and then, really, the bioresources industry is really made of three marketplaces: the feedstock marketplace, which is the generation of the residuals; the manufacturing marketplace, which is all the technologies that produce. Um, the bioproducts. So the bioproduct portfolio, so, so you can look at it as the pool of feedstocks and then um, the secondary organic waste, which are mainly landscape clippings, food scraps, manure, and biosolids. If you look at it from this vantage point uh, where the organic residuals go into making up a portfolio of, or, of bioproducts, you have all of the bioproducts on the right-hand side, 
and um, the resources on the left hand side just you know going clockwise around the cycle and you hear us talking about a lot of different uh, aspects of the bioproduct categories and that's uh, you know mulch compost biofertilizer and biochar are really the soil amendments animal feed pretty much takes place um, mostly you know, on farm but it's now with the food scrap recycling there's some municipalities like sunnyvale who actually collect it separately and return it to hog farms and other um, uh, other users of the animal of animal feed, other livestock. But then the energy and chemicals and product materials is also a big growth area, and it's a lot of what our bioresources symposium is all about, those different sectors. One of the challenges of this sector that continues is bringing together soil technologies with energy technologies, with um, material technologies, and um, and chemicals and as we transition from the chemical economy which pretty much has had its heyday since world war ii and we're moving into the biological economy that's really what the bioresources is all about but um and and all the different manufacturing for each of those bioproducts and the bioprocessing is what this whole conference and symposium is about on an annual basis. We try to look at the system as a whole system. What I've found in the last number of years is so far, I'm up to 10 unique business models for just compost. And so that means that compost as not a high value industry has a lot of different competing um, um, elements to it. So if we, if we look at that and just start from the top of the list of the community composters, the composting happens inside the community. The um, institutional composters are also part of the community, but those are larger entities. Like for the last five years, the Pasadena Rose Bowl was doing its own uh, composting and using the compost on site. And that, that became a whole thing. And there's a, a number of businesses that are trying to fill into the, just that space. Um, the new, a new kid on the block, and there's actually gonna be some seminars on this subject uh, in the new year is human mortality composting because it's now legal to do that, but there's no industry for it yet. I met a young entrepreneur, actually she's middle-aged now, but she's a math teacher in, the county where I live, and she's getting into this business for some reason. I, I don't understand, but it's it just has captured her imagination, and now she's working with a number of uh, of um, uh, 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 morticians. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, because that it's part of that industry, obviously if you consider die, dying and getting buried as an industry, but that's, this is a new, a new element to our industry. Of course, municipal and green waste composting is normally what we think of in terms of the collection systems, but right parallel to that is wastewater agencies that produce biosolids, and we heard some presentations on that. Um, and so getting those two to work together, the biosolids folks and the, um, and the solid waste folks. Um, but, you notice that I put the circles around bigger areas because some actually do all three, some only do a portion of it, like most municipal composters don't necessarily make multiple product lines. And that's kind of where we're at right now is in the bioproduct lines. The, uh, the franchise haulers, um, which are you know, contractors to the municipalities. That's a different business model because they have contracts rather than DIY like San Diego or um, Bakersfield and, some, and even city of LA who does their own composting. Independent composters is actually the largest uh, area and that's the ones that I work with a lot. Um, and in fact, the largest independent composter, Agriman has been growing for the last 30 years really and they've become the largest single composting company statewide. And um, 
On farm or retail compost markets is our association was co-founded by Kellogg Garden Products and they only do retail. They don't do bulk or um, compost, although they've, they used to be doing bulk, but they've changed and morphed into just retail. The other, they're the second largest to the other major composter, um, which is um, Scott's miracle Grow. On-farm composters have been around since farming has begun, but right now it's a new program within CDFA, and we only have one on-farm composter in our association. And in fact, they're gonna be the, that, that uh, Craig Kalaji is gonna be the lead speaker on uh, SB 1383 uh, procurement. And then, um, Food processors also are composting. So the, those are the 10 business models. And if you look at them all together, it's kind of like a bowl of SpaghettiOs. And if you try to do business strategy in competition and particularly investing, where are you going to invest? Probably not on community composting, although the new association of community compost association, which is co-funded by CalRecycle, actually has a budget that's 10 times my my association budget right now. And so we're competing, but we're also collaborating because, and that's, that's part of the theme here is, um, is how we are collaborating. And part of our collaboration is we bring it back to procurement within SB 1383, all of our communities have all of these kinds of organizations. And um, we have, of course, the private sector and our citizens, which includes, you know, farms, individual households, stores, institutions, and so forth. The other institution, a major one in our industry, are, of course, schools and universities. And um, in fact, UC uh, Cooperative Extension has just retained a new position, and that's being headed up by Michael Cohen over there. And um, and so we're hoping to get that to expand into our industry. So we create a pipeline of uh, employee, employment and workers and investors in our industry. So in the university environment, obviously the government is really important because that's what brings about 1383 at the state level. Of course, we have the national regulations and then at the local level is where all of this is happening. And a lot of this is being pushed by the NGOs, non-government organizations. The main one that like pushed SB 1383 was, uh, um, I, was um, CAW, Californians Against Waste. And they worked closely with CCC and with our association. And we still do, uh, especially annually now, we're all collaborating on International Compost Awareness Week in May. And then I put the healthcare system right in the center because for two reasons. One is, is that the healthcare industry is currently in California and nationally is actually about 17 times bigger than the whole ag industry. So when you think about that, you know, our ag industry is about one or 2% GDP. The healthcare industry is 17%. And we're saying, okay, that's an interesting picture in terms of our economy. And of course, if you look at TV now on any of the news channels, it's funded by all the pill commercials, right? So you don't see them funded by composters. So, um, so that's an interesting aspect of the disproportion elements of our economy. Yet we promote healthy soil. We have the healthy soil program in CDFA but what is healthy soil if it's not healthy plants, healthy people, healthy environment? So environmental health is a whole other thing. And that's part of the reason for all the environmental regulations. So working together in the circular economy at the local level means working across all of these institutions. And so that's kind of my main theme right now. And as we move into uh, supporting SB 1383 procurement, which is the first session, um, ACP is, is working to form uh, compost hubs, which um, roughly there we're organizing ourselves by Caltrans districts. We had some Caltrans talks yesterday. And then um, 
But right now, just recently, we're starting to work together with the Soil Hub world, which is um, the Nash NRCS and the Resource Conservation Districts. So that's the kind of collaboration that we're working on currently, and that's going to be in our future plans for uh, 2024. Next year, we have our annual planning meeting in, in January. Um, and I'm, you know, this is part of our planning process is basically how do we work with jurisdictions to to create local circular economies where composters and energy producers are all part of that economic and uh, circular economic community. So I've been doing a lot of studying in this area recently, and my most recent discovery is uh, prosocial.world, David Sloan Wilson and his associates. Um, that use, are using evolutionary science to build productive, equitable, and collaborative groups. That's a book title, actually, with the subtitle of ProSocial. And they have a whole nonprofit that helps us do this work. In addition, that work is based on some uh, Nobel laureate work by Eleanor Ostrom, who wrote a book on governing the commons, which is also used the evolution concept of institutions for collaborative action and common pool resource management or what they call CPR management. Bioresources is nothing if it's not common pool resource management. So this is the leading edge of where we're at today. And um, they have some core, eight core design principles that I want to help us implement this coming year. And maybe this can be one of the themes of next year's conference is how is this going? Uh, the eight core design principles for which Eleanor got the Nobel Prize in 2011 is uh, about these, these fundamental um, principles of shared identity, equitable distribution of contributions and benefits, fair and inclusive decision making, monitoring agreed behaviors, and um, graduated respo responding to, uh, well, I made some spelling errors there, helpful and unhelpful behavior. Um, and then fast and fair conflict resolution, which is easier said than done, and authority to self-govern, and uh, finally collaborative relations with other groups. So the circular economy is more like a network. And by the way, these slides will be in, posted on the website. So if you, and with all the, the URLs. Okay, and with that, I would like to um, go ahead and um, call up the outline and we'll get started with the first session. I should have that. There it is. Okay, so the first session today is on AB, um, um, 13, SB 1383 procurement, which if those of you who are regulation wonks, that's, that's uh, Article 12. We got Article 12 put in the regulations kind of toward the end of the regulatory development because we were talking about building compost capacity and bioenergy capacity, but that's production capacity. And if you have more supply than you have demand, you've got an imbalance in the marketplace. So the idea behind procurement was that we were gonna build the um, market capacity, not just production capacity. And what we found is that the more production capacity we build without building market capacity, what happens to price, right? Price drops. And it has been dropping to the point where not only are some composters giving away their compost, they're paying farmers to take it. And of course, the government is subsidizing that through the Healthy Soil Program. So if we want to build a circular marketplace and a circular economy, it seems to me we've got to not only balance supply and demand, but ideally have supply just enough lower than demand so that the price makes it everybody worthwhile, whether it's a municipality or whether it's a private sector in all of the 10 business models that I shared. So our first speaker 
um, today. We have three speakers, all of whom are professionals in this arena, and all of them have not only experience in this. One is, um, is like I said, the only on-farm hybrid composter that we have in our association, and that's uh, San Pasqual Valley Soils. And the business development uh, person for that is someone who's not new to most everybody in this room, and that's uh, Craig Kalaji. And then, um, and then we'll hear from Leo Beckerman, who's the head of our um, who's the head of our marketing committee, but has his own nonprofit organization, and he'll tell us all about how they are promoting procurement. And then we'll have a municipal person who's been at the head of marketing compost, uh, all, most all of her professional life. In fact, when I first got into the business 20 years ago, um, we actually had her present at our annual meeting about how to market compost, and that's Michelle Young, currently from uh, Santa Clara County. So I'd like to introduce you to Craig, who's become a, a good friend and colleague and both of us are looking down the pipeline of retirement, and but we want to hand off the industry to the rest, to the rest of the next generation, and that's part of our work in this industry. So, Craig, can um, we put up his presentation and get his him going? Okay. And uh, before Craig starts, I just want to make sure Craig knows that we do have uh, potentially Senator Allen joining us in seven minutes. Uh, <laughs> so we might have to take a pause on your presentation and uh, give uh, Senator Allen the floor and then uh, come back if that's all right. So we'll uh, uh, let you know when that uh, time hits, if that's okay. All right, not a problem. So everyone can hear me okay, I take it. And, yeah, you're on video and you're good. Yeah, so well, nice. everybody. Um, as Dan said, yeah, I've been involved in the, um, I was with the University of California as the farm advisor and county director in Santa, Santa Clara County. I actually met Michelle Young many, many years ago, uh, working with a program called San Jose in partnership with agriculture and in the diversion of organics uh, to compost for the egg community. And so uh, I go back a long ways, but currently, um, I'm working for a, a composting company that's connected with the last remaining dairy in San Diego County called San Pasqu uh, It's called Frank Coran Dairy, but the company that they started back in 2007, 16 years ago, is San Pasqual Valley Soils, where we actually recycle and compost our uh, cow manure into a product in, in addition to uh, also landscape trimmings and what have you from the local community. So. I'm, I'm deeply involved in the, in the development and marketing of compost. And what today's presentation is going to be about is uh, how I, I, as a private uh, company, uh, working for a private company, are collaborating with the local uh, jurisdictions, the county, and, and various uh, companies to really um, close the loop. And so what I'm sharing with you is the screen that was put together by... Um, Michael Wansidler, the head of uh, Recycled Organics here in San Diego County with the county, with the county organization, uh, waste, waste Management Organization. And it was done collaboratively. The actual presentation uh, involved myself, the county, as well as the city of Chula Vista. And I'm going to go through this as an example. Yeah. You're going to uh, share your screen there? Uh, am I going to share? Can you see my screen? Did the slide just move? Uh, or do I need yeah. to? Yeah, you need to so, share your screen, Greg. You need to okay, share your you screen. You can only see your camera. We can't see your screen. Oh, okay. Well, let me go back then and uh, minimize this. And let me see here. Let's see if that does the work. I thought it's so beginning I to. See, yeah. I could see my presentation, but for some reason. It, you can uh, see your desktop now. Yeah, good. Let me. Uh, <laughs> As you know, it actually because the senator just joined uh, instead of interrupting the middle of your slides. Okay, it might be a good time uh, 
to it's transition. So just stop I'll stop sharing and then we come back to this. Yeah, sounds, sounds good. good. Thanks, All right. Craig, for your flexibility. Okay. You want to? Are you in the spotlight? There he is. Yeah. Craig, can you unshare your screen, please? Great. Hello, Ben. Hey, everybody. Senator are, Allen. Are we, um, is this, is this, um, we're now live. Oh, so not, I'd like to live. introduce uh, Senator Ben Allen. He and I actually haven't formally met in face to face, but I've been introduced to you and well aware of your work. And I had already mentioned that you uh, were the sponsor of SB 54. We haven't talked a lot at this conference about SB 54, but I think it would be great if you kind of went through some of the background of what you, why, what brought you to 54 and where you think it should help to take us relative to the, um, the circular economy. And I, I, I wanted to call up for those of you in the audience, both virtually and as well as in the room here, um, who um, you know can just take a, a, a bit of a a, um, a statement of what SB thirteen uh, fifty SB fifty four is about. It's um, it's a bill that requires um well, want me to want me to jump in and talk yeah, about it why don't, why don't you go ahead and do it because okay. it has it's really passed since you're the one who sponsored it and wrote it <laughs> that would be best yeah. yeah well let's talk about it yeah so so good to see everybody um and um <clears throat> want a special shout out to my my good friend pam tuttle who, who helped to um get me involved in this Symposium, and I want to just thank everybody for your interest in circular bioresources and circularity in general, which has been a topic that I've, for better or for worse, really done a, a serious deep dive into. Um, so, so thank you for for highlighting SB fifty four, which I actually do think is worth spending some time on, uh, given how kind of globally impactful we we know it already has been, and we certainly hope it will continue to be. Um, going forward, and, and it really does put California at the heart of the global conversation about circularity. So the heart of the program is, is, is to basically ensure that packaging and food serviceware, items like single-use plastics, cups, bowls, for example, are no longer part of our linear throwaway culture, but they're circular. Now, this was a, uh, a multi-year effort that really started with China's national sword policy, uh, we used to send majority of our recycling here in California off to China, put it on ships that were coming back with empty uh, you know, shipping containers because they were bringing in so many imports. And uh, we actually were making a little bit of money off of it, believe it or not. Local governments were. And eventually China said, wait a minute, this is not working for us. So much of this material is not truly recyclable. So much of it was ending up in their waterways, incinerated, and it was creating environmental disasters in Asia. They already had enough problems that you know, let alone having it compounded by our waste problem here in California. And they basically decided to implement the national sword policy, which was to say, enough is enough. We're not taking your trash anymore. And this dramatically increased cost to local government who were tasked with handling uh, this material. It was starting to become a crisis. It was eating into funds for everything from public safety to parks, youth programs, senior programs, whatever. Uh, and that's what got me involved in this effort in the in the first place. Um, you know, it's clear to me that one-off solutions like straws on demand, you know, things like that, the plastic, even the plastic bag policies that had passed earlier, they just weren't going to be enough. We needed a larger framework to tackle this this emerging financial and environmental crisis. Which you know, we I was on a webinar last night on this topic, and it's just extraordinary how much. Uh, plastic has now entered into nearly every aspect of our lives uh, and how hard it is to, to properly dispose of. 
So back in December of 2018, we introduced SB54, the first version of SB54, which, which called for specific, ambitious, but achievable outcomes. And direct it directed CalRecycle, which is the agency that, that, that that's tasked with overseeing this issue, to develop regulations that required producers to meet these mandates. And this was very much modeled on our on our climate policy, uh, where you know the legislature said, hey, we want our economy to meet various uh, targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions. Air Resources Board, you help to drive a plan to get us there. Well, after a very intensive negotiations, we had addressed a significant number of issues that have been raised by the business community. And we were able to get a number of brands and associations move from opposition to neutral, but certainly not all. We had significant opposition still, uh, but we also had hope that momentum would carry the day. Um, it, it, it didn't by a hair. I mean, some of you were involved with this effort. We felt barely short. Um, uh, when we were trying to get it through. But we learned a few very valuable lessons. First and most importantly, um, was that, that the model that we had um, had some challenges. I think many of my colleagues and, and certainly a lot of the stakeholders really didn't want to give so much discretion to the state regulators. So we ended up spending 2000 uh, in the middle of COVID uh, recrafting the measure with the goal of drilling into the details that we'd previously left to CalRecycle, the department, to figure out during the regulatory process and moving more in a directed manner toward specifying that the responsibility for program implementation is in the you know, is, is is would be should be in the hands of the producers. And um, then when our bill failed again, uh, you know, because it's so hard to get to herd cats, a group of our key supporters, you know, believing that ultimately the California legislature just couldn't get this done, they began working on a measure for the 2022 ballot. And in 2021, uh, we got a group of legislators together that we started introducing a suite of bills, all taking aim at different pieces of this problem. And, and we, you know, and this was to, to really apply pressure along with the ballot measure on industry to come to the table and see if we could work something out that'd be meaningful. We really wanted to focus on defining the word recyclability. We had a, I had a bill a couple of years earlier, SB 343, that defined recyclable as having true and materials, not just recyclable in some lab somewhere under perfect conditions. And we saw uh, uh, you know, that term thrown around and we, we really wanted to make sure that there, there'd be truth in advertising when people put the chasing arrow symbol onto their, uh, onto their products. I mean, this is something that you know, I knew well. I mean, I, I, I'm one of the few people that still likes to read the, the physical newspaper and I would dutifully take my newspaper out of its bag. I don't know why they'd always put in a bag because it never rains. But you know, nevertheless, that 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 bag had the little chasing arrow symbol on it. I would put it into my recycling bin. Come to find out, I was actually gumming up the process. I was making the system work worse because the the film ends up getting into the paper stream. It doesn't get properly sorted. It ends up uh, gumming up the machines in the sorting system. So I actually was not helping. Uh, and material never gets recycled. So that that got me thinking. Wait a minute, we got to have some more truth in in advertising, and we should only be having the chasing arrows recycling symbol on those products that are truly getting recycled, so that we can focus on those items in the blue bins and have everything else go to the 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 you know to the to the regular trash bins and or reduce our use in and you know to source reduce in general. Okay, so we we put in a, a real strong definition of recyclable. In SB 343, there was another bill, Phil Ting's bill, uh, AB 1201, which defined compostable uh, in a similar way. It's basically that material which is actually accepted at local facilities. I don't care. You know, it's great if you could, you know, technically compost some plastic fork at you know a thousand five hundred degrees for five months at, at a at a special specialty composting site in Leipzig, Germany. If that's not if it's not you know, if it's not something that I want to put into my composting bin here in Los Angeles, it's not helping, right? That stuff is actually contaminating the composting stream. So, so basically, these two bills put some real teeth into the idea of true recyclability in real world conditions where I live and where you live and compostability too. So both of those bills passed that year. And then we had this ballot initiative that I mentioned that qualified for the ballot that summer, which then set the stage for, for really intense negotiations on SB 54 that could that, that could serve as a vehicle 
to remove the ballot measure from the ballot. One of the good things that we you know have been able to do in the legislature, one of the few good things, uh, <laughs> perhaps, is that we 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 passed a bill a few years ago that that created this mechanism whereby if people if people qualify a measure for the ballot, that can trigger a negotiation in the legislature. And if the legislature comes up with some sort of legislative alternative to the ballot measure, then the ballot measure proponents can agree to pull the ballot measure back um, in return for the passage of that responsive legislation. Why is that a good thing? Well, you know, it takes away all the unpredictability, all the money associated with a, a with a, a tough ballot fight. Um, I think that, you know, with this plastics measure, we felt, you know, it pulled very well. People, it's popular, but we also knew that industry uh, would come in and spend $100 million and would likely defeat it. So the thought was, if we could get something really meaningful through the legislature that was strong enough that it would, you know, if you make the the proponents and some of them were pretty hardcore, uh, you know, it would strong enough to to get to allow them to feel comfortable pulling the ballot measure back, but also, uh, uh, you know, and it would it would it would it would also kind of avoid a costly and unpredictable fight at the ballot. So let's get into the details of of what the deal that we ultimately struck. First of all, scope of the bill, all single use packaging. Uh, material neutral. So this this doesn't just include plastic. It also includes paper, aluminum, and glass. Those industries were initially uh, you know, skeptical of having their materials uh, in the bill because they liked the way their system worked. But actually, we were able to convince them that the way that, that even their systems don't work well, we're losing a lot of really good re recyclable material. I mean, paper, aluminum, and glass are highly recyclable, but so much of those materials don't end up getting recycled because of cross-contamination and inefficiencies in the way that we collect and sort. And then the other key thing about the bill, it's all plastic single use food service wear. And this includes everything that's serviced in restaurants, but also what's sold in stores. So there's three key policy components in the bill. First is source reduction, which is something I was just speaking to. The bill requires uh, producers to source reduce the amount of throwaway packaging and food service wear as much as possible to eliminate unnecessary waste. You know, we continue to see so much over packaging or disposable containers used instead of reusable ones. And this has just got to change. Number two, figuring out how to achieve robust source reduction. Uh, what, you know, um, you know, it, it, it was it was actually really the hardest part of the negotiations. I mean, you know, and it's a little more vague, quite frankly. You know, how do we make source reduction a reality? Um, you know, it's never been done before in other measures. Uh, we've seen plenty of one-off bans, like, you know, plastic straws, plastic bags, but comprehensive plastic source reduction was a novel concept. So here are some of the details of, of how we crafted it. First, it's plastic only. Only plastic material is subject to this requirement. We we weren't going to ask the you know people who, who have much more recyclable materials to reduce to source reduce. Um, producers as a whole must uh, meet a twenty five percent source reduction um, by both unit and weight. So this has to you know this means that producers can aggregate the reduction. It doesn't mean you know, it also doesn't need to be done by producer. So for some producers, reductions are going to be, you know, easy. And for some, like those have been working really hard over the years to reduce plastic waste, it might be harder. So it also means that, that success is measured by two separate metrics. We need to see an overall reduction in the number of plastic containers on the market and a separate reduction in the weight of plastic coming on to the market. And this double metric will guard against any gaming of the system through simply lightweighting, by example. You know, maybe, um, you know, so I think everyone can understand that. So um, now 10% of the reductions have to come from reuse and refill or eliminating plastic. Uh, we also sent some really, really aggressive interim targets, 10% by 2027 with, you know, 2% from reuse to refill, 20% by 2030 with 4% from you reuse refill. And then the rest of the source reduction goals can be achieved through other strategies, including optimization, lightweighting, concentrating, shifting to another packaging type, et cetera. Um, using recycled content, it gives a, a kind of an alternative compliance. We capped it at 8%, but it, but we did want to do something in, in the source reduction goals to incentivize and encourage the growth of recycling markets. And, and so we gave a special credit for the use of recycled content. Okay. Um, the second important mandate after source reduction is what is actually driving the circularity of this, this broader program. The bill requires whatever packaging or foodware is left on the market to be truly recyclable or compostable. So here we, we, we rely 
on the really robust definitions that were established in those two bills that I mentioned, SB 343 and 1201, to ensure material that's put on our store shelves has true end materials. They, they can actually be, they, they, they will, they can and will be turned into something else after they're used. So this means that packaging, you know, uh, uh, you know, will, will actually be recycled um, as opposed to just giving us that good feeling from sorting a bottle into the blue recycling bin and hoping for the best. You know, we, we really want that bottle. If they're going to, if they're going to claim circularity, if, if we're, if they're going to meet compliance under our bill, I mean, I, you know, I don't love plastic. I'd like to see us move toward other products, but um, you know, but there are some plastic materials that are truly recyclable. We got to hold those folks accountable to those recycling uh, ambitions and 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 goals that they keep alluding to. So we want to see this. You know, we're going to hold them accountable to it. It has to be their 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 item. You know, needs to be entirely recyclable and recycled, turned into another product, which is then recycled into yet another product over and over again. And and to help build the necessary markets for the material which is a really key part of this, right? You, you know, even if something's technically recyclable, if it's not turned into a product that actually, where there's a market for it, all is for naught, right? So, so we have these really ambitious recycling rates that are built into the bill to hold folks accountable. This is going to ensure that packaging producers actually buy back the bales of material that they use to package products, which is the key to circularity. One of the problems we've seen is it's so cheap to just buy that virgin plastic. It's basically a byproduct of the oil refining process. And so it was undermining recycling markets. And so under the bill by 2028, each material category and type. So for example, a category would be PET and the type would be a, like a clamshell container. They, you know, each of these material categories and types have to re achieve a 30% recycling rate. And then by 2030, it ramps up to 40%. And then by 2032, the, re the required rate is 65%. And that means that 65% of each material category and type is being collected, processed, and actually turned into new packaging or an alternative product. And for material to meet that metric, there has to be a robust market. And then finally, the bill establishes this extended producer responsibility program that shifts the burdens of managing this material to the producers instead of on our cities or our counties or in truth, local residents who are stuck trying to figure out, is this recyclable, is this recyclable? And, and, and it's so hard to even buy products that are environmentally responsible just on a normal trip to the store. Our whole concept here was that producers have to have skin in the game. These are the folks who understand their products, their markets, their customers, and their design the best. Uh, they they understand all those issues, and 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 we need to bring them into the story and make them responsible for 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 coming up with solutions that are at the end of the day all about their products, right? I mean, how how you know they need to be responsible as opposed to putting that responsibility on just normal consumers and their and the cities where they live. So the bill actually gives the producers a great deal of, of flexibility on how to achieve the mandates, but it requires them to work together through producer responsibility organizations or PROs to increase efficiency. This is modeled after something that they've done very successfully up in British Columbia. Um, you know, I mean, ultimately, it's about making sure these are the guys who they're making the shampoo bottle, right? And 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 it's it's ultimately they're the ones deciding whether that shampoo bottle is sold. That shampoo is sold in a bottle that is readily recyclable or not. And and it's these producers of these bottles that decide also whether or not to manufacture the container with cheap virgin plastics, or alternatively with post-consumer resins or more environmentally sustainable product altogether. And in nearly every case because of market forces, producers have just opted for the cheap option. I mean, which has basically created a situation where there's just no market for, for recycled material. But requiring packaging to achieve high recycling rates is then going to, 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 to force the producers to take some action to pursue more sustainable alternatives. Either they're gonna meet these higher recycling rates or they're gonna have to move to a non-plastic alternative. And the bill pushes producers to invest in a robust reuse and refill infrastructure, shift from material types that can't be recycled, meaning those that are just ultimately gonna end up in the landfill or an incinerator or lost to the environment. And it's it really pushes them to build the market for post-consumer content that's also gonna boost collection efforts, keeping material out of our oceans and our communities. I mean, our goal here is to create the infrastructure and push companies to make sustainable materials so that the consumers don't have to think twice when standing in their kitchens or standing in the store 
you know, trying to determine whether something should go in the blue bin, go into the trash. Should I buy this? Should I buy that? Um, so the bill allows producers to form just one PRO, producer responsibility organization initially. And then, and, you know, we're actually expected, expecting CalRecycle to approve the PRO in early January. So it's happening. And this is a PRO that's going to include all material types. And, and then additional PROs can be approved after eight years. Uh, this gets the, allows the program to get up and running before either the state or producers would have to, you know, to, to uh, con, you know, contend with a different PRO. Um, you know, they have a they, they have a plan and a budget. They have to outline how they're going to achieve the requirements of the bill. Um, there's a whole robust oversight process. You know, the producers have to pay the fees to the PRO to cover all, all the all the key costs. Um, you know, and then the key thing here is yes, we put the, pr the producers in the in the driver's seat to to lead the program, but that doesn't mean anything unless we have strong oversight. And ultimately, we give a strong oversight role to CalRecycle, the department, to enforce the program, including very strict penalties that they can impose per day per violation based on a product line. Um, you know, we have to where they have to meet these really aggressive rates and dates for 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 meeting the various goals of of the bill. One last important um, a policy point to mention: SB fifty four requires producers of plastic covered material to pay a mitigation fee to fund efforts to clean up plastic pollution already in the environment. This was something very important to the environmental justice community, and I'm really proud of. It's going to generate at least five hundred million dollars a year for ten years, five billion dollars a year, uh, which which will go to help uh, largely low income and disadvantaged communities that have been so impacted by um, the plastic pollution crisis. Anyway. I threw a lot at you, happy to talk more about it, but this was a really significant victory. We're so proud of the work we got done. And I gotta say, um, so much of how we were able to do this is because of the the the, the fact that, that producers knew that California electorate, the California voters care a lot about this issue. There was, there was a lot of buzz in the environmental community and the press. And they knew that even though, um, you know, they could they could keep defeating efforts to make progress in this area in the legislature, you know, year by year, they knew in the end of the day that the dam would break, and it's what drove them to the table, brought them to the negotiating situation, and and you know, I'm just so glad we've been able to get this across the finish line. And now it's already starting to spur investment in markets around the world, and we're getting phone calls from journalists and also companies and investors who know now that in order to meet the SB 54 requirements, and remember California on its own is tied for fourth largest economy in the world. So nobody can ignore our market. And so as to be able to meet our requirements under SB 54, all of the big distributors, retailers, producers know that they're gonna have to uh, uh, come up with new, innovative, more sustainable alternatives. Uh, and, 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 it's, and, and the bill is now spurring a, a renaissance of investment in those uh, entrepreneurs that are that are coming up with new, more environmentally friendly alternatives to the status quo. So I'm really proud of that. And, um, you know, there we are. So happy to take any whatever questions and participate in the discussion as we go. Thank you. Yes, uh, very much so and really appreciate it. I have one, I don't know if it's a short question, it may be a long answer, but um, the role of compostable packaging in that, of course, in our industry, um, or at least the compost industry, which I uh, represent, and as well as the energy, the bioenergy industry doesn't want to see any of that packaging in our feedstocks, um, and uh, and that and we'll continue to work with CalRecycle and with each other, and with local communities to see that that doesn't happen. Is uh, what were the accommodations in there? And then if there's any other people that have questions, um, yeah, we can take I mean, them and then we're going to have to move on. Yeah. So, so we've incorporated these very robust definite, this very, very robust definition for compostability from AB 1201 into SB 54. So your, your point is very well taken, which is that there are people that are out there claiming that an item is compostable consumers and quite frankly retailers are, are you know, no 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 better and they're just using the material think they're doing right there by the environment throwing that item into the composting bin and as you say it's actually making the situation worse so we are we are uh we have but baked into this this whole policy regime is ground truthing which is to say you can't you can't claim recyclability or compostability, and you can't be in compliance 
with our recycling and composting rates, if you're putting products on the market that aren't actually recyclable or compostable under real world conditions in California. Gotcha. And, and so that's being overseen by the uh, SB 54 commission. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Well, yes. Uh, specifically, uh, Cal Recycle has a, um, uh, an office that, that is in charge of, of, of that process, that ground truthing. Great. Any other questions for the Senator? before we move on. A quick question from online. Uh, Cynthia Lyles asked, uh, you mentioned British Columbia has been very successful. What key components of their program do you see that can be uh, replicated in California? Yeah, um, so the, the British Columbia, I think at least in our hemisphere has probably been the most successful leader in this concept of producer uh, extended producer responsibility. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of their forestry practices, but uh, but in this area of work, uh, I think they've been a real global leader. And it's it's this basically in pioneering this idea and really implementing this idea of of forcing the producers to take responsibility for the true circularity of their products, and 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 getting them to set up these producer responsibility organizations, which are then held accountable by the ministry for meeting. Uh, circularity rates and goals. So that's um, ultimately that that that's what we modeled off of British Columbia. We went up there a number of times. Uh, of course, you know, much smaller place, uh, you, different culture. Uh, but 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 it's it but it, but essentially, we have been very inspired by British Columbia's extended producer responsibility system with regards to plastics and 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 circularity and waste reduction in general. Any other questions, Kevin, or no? Well, I want to thank you very much for your taking time out of your schedule, Ben, to ed educate the conference or the symposium participants, uh, including myself, because I haven't spent a lot of attention on 54, so I'm really glad you were able to you know, enlighten us and, and also for all the incredible work you did to make, get this, make this thing happen. Well, I appreciate it. You know, we actually have a PowerPoint. I don't know. I guess it didn't get through, but, but maybe, maybe Sam, you can post it in the link and we can also put in the chat and we can maybe uh, post some, some other materials associated with the bill. So if people want to do some follow-up, um, you know. Yeah, we'll do that for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Okay. Back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, can we get Craig back on? He was just about to start his presentation. Well, the mind back you on, and Hussein is going to uh, yeah, handle we'll take, the Let's line. take a break in the middle sometime, because we've only been going an hour. Yeah. Okay. So Hussein is going to post the slides on his end, just so that there's no, because I, it's sometimes I was seeing it, you weren't, and vice versa. So I thought it'd be easier if he just uh, handled it, and I'll just tell him to advance the slides. So, Hussein, okay. if you can bring up the first slide. He's in the middle of it. There it is. There we go. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, anyway, uh, let me just. Uh, change my view a little bit here. Um, since 1983, uh, we're going to focus on how uh, the public-private partnership between San Francisco Valley Soils, who I work for, and um, the various organizations, including the county of San Diego, the cities, and that, that are tasked with implementing that bill, are collaborating here locally in San Diego County to meet these requirements. Uh, so the title is Collaboration in Local Economy. Next slide, please. Uh, actually, this is, oh, got to go back one. Uh, yeah, it looks like the same slide, but it's, this is actually, uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you is a slide presentation that was produced collaboratively uh, on behalf of, uh, in working with Michael Wonsider, the program manager for public works in recycling here in San Diego and the cities of uh, Chula Vista and San Pasqual Valley Soils. And this presentation was first presented 
to uh, the Associate, uh, American Society of Landscape Architects in San Diego at their executive board meeting. So it was designed for them, but then it went on to morph, if you will, and be used to produce uh, a slide presentation. The same slide presentation was presented to SANDAG here in San Diego, which is the San Diego Association of Governments, which is a regional planning uh, program uh, here in the county that uh, uh, is very powerful. Uh, I think this year they will uh, dedicate $644 million to various projects, uh, collaborative projects, both in the public and private sector. So what I'm going to be showing you is, is the presentation we collaboratively put together to introduce various entities within San Diego uh, economy, including the designers, the architects, the regional planners. And so next slide, please. So uh, what I want to do is just what what the purpose of the slide presentation was to lay out the challenge that we're faced with. Why Senate Bill 1383? So this first slide is talking about methane gas as a super pollutant and the impacts of climate change and the cost uh, of climate change as it relates to uh, drought in the agricultural industry and in job creation and what have you. It's negative impacts on California. This feedback is what drove the, the uh, Senate Bill 1383 mandate. Next slide. So part of that solution was that it was decided that California needs more organic recycling infrastructure. And so a, a lot, and here's a slide indicating the organic waste comprises more than a third of all of California's waste stream and what the challenges are in the organic components of that waste stream. Food waste being a big one that had been unaccounted for in many respects, we were collecting it. Landscape trimmings, obviously most of us, when we think of, of organic waste, we oftentimes think of our landscape trimmings and what have you, but not so much our food waste. Well, uh, that was going to the landfills no longer. And then compostable paper. Next slide. California needs to build, they estimate 50 to 100 new organic waste processing facilities to meet, meet the mandate to divert up to 75% of our organics from our current landfills. Next slide. So what does that look like? Well, SB 1383 is all about closing the loop on organic recycling economy, similar to what Senate uh, Senator uh, Allen was talking about with plastics. Uh, we're doing that with recycled organics. The demand for recovered organic products drives the infrastructure investments. So on the right, you see a, a circle, literally. And uh, it starts with number one, the collection. Number two, the recycling and recovery. Three was the unique characteristics of SB 1383 that required procurement for the cities to procure and utilize. And then the last one, that closes this loop, which is the big last mile that is such a challenge logistically that we're gonna be talking about uh, both here and in earlier uh, or later presentations with Leo Beckerman uh, of Zero Footprint. So that end use, how do we use all these procured recovered organic waste products? Next slide. Well, let's take a look at what we're really talking about here. Uh, in San Diego, 1.5 million tons of compostable organics can no longer be landfill, but need to be diverted, okay? That equates to three to four million cubic yards of compost and mulch if we just focus on that bioresource of recovered products. Next slide. So if we start breaking this down in terms of uh, woods procurement requirements based on the population of the jurisdictions or cities, and I think most of us that are familiar with SB 1383 know the formula. Next slide. San Diego region has over three, well, roughly three and a half million residents. Next. That equates to 268,000 tons of raw organic waste. Next. And then we start converting that over to mulch and compost. We start to get a better picture of just how much material we're really talking about procuring and repurposing. Uh, we also have the renewable fuels and, and the electricity from biomass. We're not going to be covering those in this presentation. Next. So one of the ways that all of this starts to make sense is the ability to 
uh, record and track what we're talking about. Jurisdictions must maintain records so Cal Recycle can then verify that they're actually doing what they're being asked to do. And so this is where the rubber meets the road for many jurisdictions. It's going to require a lot of training, and we'll get into that in a little later in my presentation. But this is a critical component. It's also one that uh, Leo Beckerman will be talking about in detail in just a few minutes uh, when he gets on board and gives his presentation. Next. Water quality and erosion control landscaping sectors. Total current sales in just this sector alone, as you can see, uh, needs to go to a potential sales of 1.5 million cubic yards. And so you can see we have where we're at today and where we need to go and just in mulch and compost procurement utilization, it's a big hill to climb. Next. There are a lot of different markets that compost and mulch can be utilized uh, that we're all familiar with. And some of the presentations that, uh, or uh, I should say groups that this presentation was delivered to involved the actual city parks and the county parks here in San Diego County. So city parks, landscape center divides, community or school gardens, erosion control along roadways, some of the work that Caltrans is doing. Uh, can we utilize our materials in cooperation with the Caltrans project? Cities hosting compost and mulch giveaways. Next. So these are some of the things that typically come to mind when we talk about uh, the utilization of the material. Next. There we go. Dan talked about soil health. It's in the very DNA of the Association of Compost Producers, but oftentimes, what do we mean by soil health? Uh, it's not a well understood uh, term simply because when we use the word health, we imply a living system. We don't, uh, we don't talk about healthy rocks. So why do we talk about healthy soil? Well, certainly the mineral component is important, the physical characteristics, chemical, but the biological component of all soils is what we mean when we stop, talk about soil health. And when we engage all of that living capital, if you will, in the soil, to work on our behalf, it starts to yield tremendous value to society in terms of its ability, for example, to allow water to infiltrate and for water to hold more moisture. So the organic material is the food source of this life in the soil. It is the feedstock, if you will. It's how we, so when we look at that biological component of soils, think of it as a livestock that needs to be fed Organic material is a key component of that, along with the mineral and the physical characteristics that come with soils in general. It serves as a filter and a sponge for degraded pollutants and maintaining water quality. So there's all of these fabulous benefits. Where we're at now in the evolution of the use of recycled organics and repurposing is teaching people to understand how they use this resource, compost and mulch, to feed that livestock and to improve the quality and the life within the soil itself. Next slide. So Caltrans, as you heard yesterday, has been involved for years, uh, uh, involved with the use, utilization of compost on many of their projects. And they did a number of case studies that you heard about yesterday. I won't go into that in detail other than to point it out. Next slide. But they did it based on good, solid science, okay? And, and regardless of how people question whether science has all the answers or not, it is the vehicle in which we verify, are we doing something right or are we not accomplishing what we're trying to do? So there was a lot of research uh, looking at compost utilization, for example, in erosion control on bare soil versus comparing it to straw nettings, uh, BMPs, jute, and vegetable, uh, uh, vegetative uh, materials on soils like straw and what have you. And what we found out is compost is extremely efficient and effective as a erosion control and soil stabilization tool. Next. So Caltrans, as well as landscapers and construction companies have taken advantage of this research 
And we now have compost-based, and I call them SMPs rather than BMPs. We're all familiar with best management practices. But oftentimes, the best management practice ends up being the cheapest management practice based on the financial needs of the, of the uh, organization that's trying to solve the problem. We need to start going back to what is most sustainable from a biological perspective. And so soil um, health speaks to a soil that has sustainable management practices as a part of the equation. Restoration and remediation then become important terms. And for the application of compost, there are tools like blower trucks, compost blankets, which is nothing other than a one to two inch layer of fine to horse. As you heard yesterday, Caltrans uses, likes to use a balance of course with the fine so that when they overseed it with seeds, that fine material supports the seed establishment, but the coarse material holds it on the slopes. And as we all know, California has a lot of slopes. San Diego particularly is a county of canyons and slopes and mesas. So being able to hold the material where you placed it so that it can do what it was designed to do is really critical when it comes to the utilization. It can be used for bank stabilization where we have streams and rivers and uh, compost can be used to create living walls rather than gray infrastructure, lowering the heat potential of an environment and cooling, cooling that environment, that city. Minimizing heat island effect, you can use compost in the construction of these walls rather than concrete or some other material. Next. Here's an example of, a, of the Caltrans project that was talked about yesterday, showing on the upper surface a compost blanket and berms in this particular case to filter that water, slow down, take energy out of that flow. And then what happens below when you compare it to conventional uh, stormwater uh, techniques and best management practices, uh, the bonded fiber matrix with straw waddles. And you can see under a severe storm event, this case, it was five inches in one day in a highly erodible soil. And you can see the difference when you work with nature versus you come along and you do a temporary, as Kyle Trans described yesterday, a temporary fix that oftentimes can't stand up to the rigors of the kind of climatic events that we're now experiencing. Next. Um, here's a high wall project I was involved with here in San Diego where literally we had 400 linear feet of rock. It was, it was a rock quarry. And the uh, property owners wanted to build homes and they said, we need to get something to grow on this on these walls that have been mined for gravel and, and rock for decades. And so we actually took a seven acre severe slope applied about 964 cubic yards of compost at about a one inch depth and applied native seed, a whole blend of native seeds to it. And uh, you can see the results after uh, a year or two, uh, we were literally able to grow with the help of the organic material, grow native plants on this rock quarry wall, 400 feet up and stabilize that. And obviously you can see the results next. So we know it works. Here's another example up in Northern California in Gilroy, right outside Gilroy off of Hecker Pass Road where a homeowner, so literally their slope had completely eroded. Next slide. And we're gonna go through a series. So what we did, uh, or no, I'm sorry, this is not the Gilroy. This is another one back east. I, I apologize. This one was actually back in North Carolina where they get a lot of rain. And what they did is they put the compost in this geotextile material, a mesh, and seeded the compost before they fill the, the tubular mesh socks. Next slide. And lo and behold, they stabilize that with a good geotextile. The geotextile then is covered in stabilizing that stream from the stress of high flows of water, but still has the vegetation growing to also help with anchoring it and provide ecosystem benefits to that environment much nicer than, let's say, a concrete channel. Here's the one, okay, next slide. Here's the one in Gilroy I was referring to. This was the slope right off Hecker Pass near a stream that actually was a spawning area for certain uh, salmon and other steelheads. And the, the wall had collapsed 
the homeowner didn't know what to do. The, the regulatory folks said, well, you're going to clean it up because you're literally damaging that stream. Next. So what they did is they, uh, they, they literally uh, graded that slope, stabilized it, and then covered it with compost growing socks, a, a compost, just straight, fine compost, half inch minus compost, and then wrapped it in geogrid and anchored that onto the slope. And you can see the three foot sections, they just layered that and then wrapped it and then anchored it in with uh, gripple anchors, similar to a duckbill anchor to hold that material on there. Next slide. And this is what it looked like after they established it with, with irrigation. They did irrigate this up uh, to make sure that the vegetation got established in that slope. Next slide. Eventually, uh, a, a year later, looked like this. So that's what you can do with compost when you know how to use the technology uh, that can uh, optimize its ability to do what nature intended it to do, which is feed that vegetation and stabilize that slope. Next. Here's a, a large scale post fire remediation with compost filter socks. A lot of research was done and is being done at Chico State up north on the, uh, if you remember the campfire up in Paradise, uh, extensive amounts of compost socks were used to remove the toxic chemicals coming off the burn site that were in, impacting negatively the riparian habitat and the watershed up in the Paradise area. And here was the lilac fire here in San Diego where we wrapped the site to pre prevent any of the contaminants coming off and going down into the, uh, the channels and the rivers surrounding and the watershed surrounding this area in lilac. Next slide. So, We've seen just some examples, and that's just a small sampling of what can be done when one educates oneself. But compost best management practices, or what I like to term sustainable management practice, align with the climate action plans and comply with state requirements. They improve the storm water quality and reduce erosion significantly by reducing the runoff volume. Compost has the ability, as we know, to absorb a tremendous amount of water. When we reduce the volume of runoff, do we have an erosion problem? No, because we then capture that water and infiltrate it into the groundwater where we can then repurpose and reutilize it. The nutrients and pollutants are decomposed by naturally occurring microorganisms that living soil feedstock is working for us to clean that those contaminants that are present in the environment. And then the carbon benefits, the ability to sequester millions of tons atmospheric carbon back into the soil simply by applying and supporting, applying organics and supporting the vegetative growth in the establishment of vegetation. And then that soil structure and nutrient content, better plant health, reduces the need for chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. Again, working with nature, mimicking what nature would do if left to its own devices. Next. So, Wrap this thing up a little bit here. Next steps, the call to action. This is what we went out to the various groups, the landscape architects, Sandag, the parks, and communication and training. It starts there to the staff and the contractors on operational, environmental, and economic benefits of using compost and mulch. This is not being taught in our schools. We all have to contribute and participate in this communication and training effort if Senate Bill 1383 is ever to be a success. We need to become engaged and promote updates to address erosion control and water quality project specs using locally produced compost and mulch. And we need to quantify the benefits of potential projects using a full cost analysis through the use of tools that are available but need to be implemented and case studies to demonstrate economic environmental value of best management or sustainable management practices. And then collaborate. Collaborate wherever you can with local colleges, horticultural and erosion control training programs to share information on these practices. Next. Well, that wraps it up. I just want to give credit to uh, Michael Wansider and the staff at the County of San Diego Recycling that helped put this together, the city of Chula Vista. And I want to just say, uh, before we open this to questions, that this need to collaborate has never been more critical. 
the public-private collaboration is occurring. It needs to occur at a higher rate if we are to solve these problems and really mimic nature to yield some of the ecosystem benefits we know are there if we just simply educate ourselves. So that's it, Dan. Thank you, Craig, very much. We're going to hold questions until the end and um, right now. So thank you, Craig. This is great. And we can have them with the entire panel as long as they can be there. I think um, right now we have an 1130 cutoff time, uh, but we'll probably get to the questions bef well before that. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Leo um, Beckwith. And um, Leo come, came to our association as a member initially a few years back, wanting to engage with composters from his organization, a nonprofit called Zero Footprint, which was actually formed to um, address this issue of procurement. And it's taken me a couple of years to understand their business model because it's it, it was so unusual to me. And I just have to say that I was somehow mentally blocked from understanding what Leo is and his uh, compatriots are doing. So, but Leo also decided he wanted to be on the board of the Association of Compost Producers. And he was immediately um, elected to that last year for a three year term. So I really appreciate working with him. He also heads up our uh, marketing working group and since I learned business through my wife with the restaurant business, and that's the industry that he came through with Zero Food Print, and I'll let him explain the program and how that relates to SB 1383 procurement. Leo? Thanks, Dan. I just wanna make sure uh, my screen is being shared right now. Well, unless I hear yeah, otherwise. You're, yeah, you're okay. good. It Thank is. you very much. Uh, well, thanks everyone. Thanks for being here. As you heard, my name is Leo Beckerman. I'm the Director of Operations for Zero Footprint. We are a nonprofit based in the Bay Area of California, but we work uh, state and increasingly nationwide. We are at the, the cross of uh, climate and agriculture, um, and we'll get a little bit more into that. I'm going to talk about, uh, build on a lot of what we heard with SB 1383. And thank you, Dr. K, for all the, the background on that, um, particularly focused on our program and procurement issues. So uh, as you heard, and as you see, uh, these are some sort of general rough estimates about the increased capacity we're going to need as 1383 really starts to roll out. And when we look at procurement, this is an area that I think a lot of people, particularly in jurisdictions, start scratching their heads because the numbers are very large. And so uh, if every single jurisdiction met their targets and had 100% compliance exclusively through compost, we'd be looking at 1.8 million tons of compost procured annually. And uh, like I said, that number is, is a little big for me to wrap my own head around. So I like to think about it in truckloads and 90,000 truckloads is uh, more than a literal ton. Uh, so it's really just a huge number. And I think when you are a jurisdiction, you think about your uh, the land within the jurisdiction, parking, you know, uh, medians, uh, little green spaces in parking lots, uh, land by the side of the highway, or uh, playgrounds, fields, etc. cetera. And uh, in general, we don't have enough uh, land in urban areas to really accommodate that. So what are we gonna do with it? Let's assume that we start seeing more and more procurement. So where are we gonna put it all? Well, agriculture is currently uh, about two thirds of the co existing compost market uh, in California. And California has 24 million acres of managed farmland. And not just thinking about a place to put it, but thinking about the extended good and the extended positive impact we can have. Because what we don't wanna see is jurisdictions procuring compost and dumping it on the side of the road or dumping it or not using it. Compost has a huge 
uh, long-term positive potential impact when used correctly. And I'm not just talking about avoided emissions through removing organics from landfill, but I'm talking about long-term sequestration. So here you can see uh, if compost were applied on just 25% of the rangelands, you know, uh, we'd have a huge potential long-term impact, which is great, but there's some barriers to this. So we think about procurement and jurisdictions are needing to procure compost, but that's not the end of it, right? You can't just buy something. This isn't a product that you can put in an envelope and ship off somewhere. The volume and the weight is, is great. And in addition to the cost associated with purchasing compost, you have to get it to a place. So shipping or, or hauling, and then you have to apply it to the land. So spreading. Zero Footprint has overseen about 200 compost application projects in agriculture. And we see an average of 500, rather 50 to $100 per ton of compost once it's purchased, hauled out to the site and applied to the land. And that is a huge cost, especially when you think about uh, 1.8 million tons being required uh, and then times 50 to $100 per ton. So we have a program that essentially shares the cost when uh, between a jurisdiction, between farms and ranches, between private fundraising, as well as state, local, and federal grants. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I wanna to talk to you about Zero Food Print for a second. Um, we were founded in 2015, actually focusing on restaurants looking to reduce their carbon footprint. And what we found after doing about a hundred assessments in restaurants is that regardless of the type of restaurant and their operations, the majority of the climate impact, the carbon emissions were coming from the food itself. And we realized that we needed to get involved in a way to improve the growing of food, to make it a climate beneficial activity. And we also knew that we couldn't do this on our own. The cost is, is just very great. So we are focused on uh, bringing together in a collective action sort of way, funds from a variety of sources in order to make these practices accessible for farms and ranches so that the work that they're doing not only is beneficial to them and their yield or their own farm and their own business, but improves the land and then also our environment in our atmosphere. So Zero Footprint is, is working on this. And to give perspective, I think uh, Dr. K had quite a few nice uh, drawings about healthy soil, but I wanna bring an additional perspective. I, I think seeing is believing. And you can see here two side-by-side -side images. And I certainly can know, I can look at this and say, which, uh, which, land I would want my carrot planted in, right? Which, uh, what products I would want to eat out of gro uh, a food grown from certain uh, soils. And so that's just on a personal and a product level, but also you look again, the potential of changing the way we use our managed land is incredibly impactful and huge when it comes to climate emissions. So something to think about. Now, we run a, a grant program for farms and ranches, and we look at um, this sort of the, the benefit per dollar. And this is going to come around to how we got involved in compost. But our grant program is is funded from private businesses and individuals. Um, and what we do is we have an application process where farms and ranches tell us what they're interested in doing, and we are able to rank their applications based on, again, that cost benefit. What is it going to cost to sequester how much carbon dioxide or CO2E, the equivalence of carbon dioxide? So this is a little bit of our system, just to know that uh, it's not just about procurement for us, but we have a long history of working with farms and ranches to implement practices that are good for the farmer, good for the land, and good for the environment. How do we se select these uh these projects, well, as I said, we're looking at the carbon benefit and how do we get that? Well, we use the Comet Planner, which is a modeling tool that came out of uh, USDA as well as Colorado State University. 
and California has their own special version of it. And what we do is we can put in the location as well as the types of practices and the types of land and get a result uh, of the total carbon emissions that are uh, modeled to be sequestered. And so we are using sort of standardized data that, as I said before, the USDA is using, uh, CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture is using, and is generally uh, the most accessible way to, to start modeling the benefits. And what we found is in our program that compost is just an incredibly accessible and cost-effective way to model, to, to sequester greenhouse gases. So we saw 1383 coming down the line and we said, we know who likes to use compost or who could really use some compost and benefit from it and could help us, meaning those of us in California, those of us in the United States, in the world benefit from this uh, improved soil health uh, and improved and increased drawdown of carbon dioxide. And we created a program called Compost Connector. Compost Connector is really about matching uh, jurisdictions looking to procure compost uh, with farms and ranches who are interested in using that compost. And so we have this compost connector program that we have online uh, where farms and ranches can essentially tell us what they're doing and apply to become what is called a direct service provider. And they tell us that they are uh, looking to use compost and they're ready to do it on behalf of a jurisdiction. And in order to facilitate this transaction, we use uh, the jurisdiction's dollars to provide incentives to farms and ranches so that their costs are reduced so that they don't necessarily have to pay that 50 to $100 per ton. Maybe they can pay 40 or $30 or $20 per ton. In many cases, uh, we are able to bring together funding sources so that the farmer pays nothing, which is really helpful because uh, there are a number of costs associated with, say, getting off fossil fuels and fertilizers. And so this isn't something that your average farmer can necessarily just bear the cost or the burden of. We've seen a lot of times when uh, we've heard stories just anecdotally of participants in our program who are able to use compost for the first time or who are able to add new fields or increase the compost use because of our uh, program that essentially is reducing the cost or providing um, free compost to, to farms and ranches. And we're doing this in a way that doesn't necessarily impact the composter, right? So that the, the market isn't impacted because there's a third party that's providing this essentially rebate or discount, as opposed to a compost vendor saying, I'm going to give this away for free. And when something is valued at zero, then we see that the, that generally the market values it at that cost or zero. So on the back end, we're able to really be as efficient as possible. Uh, and that means keeping track of who's requesting what, how much, when they want to use it, um, the, their land types, et cetera, and indicating if they're able to provide some cost share or what type of help they might need with these logistics such as freight and spreading. And this is getting into what I think is really important uh, for jurisdictions, which is the record keeping and reporting. And that is something that this program, as I said, Compost Connector is doing so that jurisdictions are essentially able to engage with Zero Footprint uh, as a single kind of vendor to cover all their compost procurement, um, let's say, needs or requirements. We're not only uh, finding and making that matchmaking happen between the farm and ranch and the jurisdiction, but we're keeping all the records and making sure that reporting and compliance is as easy as possible for the jurisdiction. Uh, as 1383 has rolled out, we've seen some of the larger jurisdictions need to hire staff solely focused on 1383. And again, looking at these costs of 50 to $100 per ton uh, you can see that the costs can really be high and the ability to work together or outsource some of the compliance requirements is a more efficient use of funds. Let's, hold on, sorry about that. 
Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, Zero Footprint is a climate organization. And so we are able to, through Comet and through keeping track of the practices that the farms and ranches are using, we're able to uh, keep track of and model that carbon sequestration and provide that to the jurisdictions. Because as we know, SB 1383 is started as a short-lived climate pollutant avoidance bill. It's a climate bill. And what it's not taking into account is the potential long-term benefits when we talk about sequestration. It's really only focused on the avoidance of, of methane, which is fantastic, but there's so much more possible, especially when compost is the way that we're uh, meeting our procurement targets. And so we are able to model and measure those benefits and provide that benefit to the jurisdiction so that there's additional value. It's not just meeting their 1383 procurement target. It can be part of their climate action plan. It can be part of their contribution to um, state goals when it comes to carbon drawdown, when it comes to, the, for example, the uh, scoping plan, when we see the Air Resources Board talk about increased organic agriculture in the state of California. We keep track of all of this information and are able to provide reports um, and our hope is that this provides enough value that we can start to continue, well, that we can rather continue to fund uh, these practices and fund the people who are literally on the ground doing the work that benefits all of us. And again, here's an example of zero footprint being listed in uh, a, a climate action or a climate mobilization plan. And so what we're hoping to see is that all of these opportunities start coming together so that we can really stack value. So that 1383 procurement is doing much more than just checking the box when it comes to procurement targets, that it can be contributing to uh, local climate plans, that it can be contributing to local business through agriculture and the food production so that we can show and demonstrate things that we heard from Dr. K, such as water savings and stormwater management. I think these are there are so many benefits when we use compost in an appropriate way. And we are just at the beginning of being able to really share and measure and model those, those benefits. And so being able to bring all of that uh, into a clear report to show uh, jurisdictions we are seeing that there's additional value to be had and hopefully it makes uh, procuring and meeting uh, SB 1383 procurement targets a little bit easier. So looking ahead, there are a lot of these things that we are talking about when it comes to uh, the benefits for jurisdictions, but also the funding sources. So um, as you heard earlier, we talked about the CDFA, that's the California Department of Food and Agriculture Healthy Soil Program. Uh, the majority of funding for that goes to farms for purchasing compost. Um, the USDA has quite a bit of funding for compost, as well as a recent grant program throughout the United States called the Climate, rather the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities, um, that will be funding all sorts of uh, new and existing agricultural practices, compost being one of them. Uh, EQIP is another USDA uh, funding program, also funding compost. So how can we do that and bring 1383 and the funds all together so that we can actually pay for the real cost of these practices and that we can start taking credit for that, right? Including it in our climate action plans. I'm not talking about selling carbon, uh, soil carbon through carbon markets. I'm talking about measuring and monitoring and being able to understand the impact and gain value from that not necessarily selling them on a market. Uh, we heard about the last mile. So as we see an increase in compost demand and funding, we're gonna have to improve the infrastructure to get compost uh, out to farms and ranches that last mile uh, that we heard about. Um, we're seeing and we'll hear uh, for in a minute from a jurisdiction that is actually running their own carbon farming program with climate smart practices, compost being a major one. So seeing how jurisdictions can take part in this. And then also we've got the California Carbon Farming Registry, which is supposed to be online early next year, 
which is essentially a list of, of farm projects looking for funding. And this will be run by uh, California state government. And so this will be another way that jurisdictions can essentially say that they are funding these projects and show uh, to the to Cal Recycle, to the world to, and, and their constituents that they are participating in this local uh, economy. So I look forward to taking your questions later, but uh, thanks everyone for uh, hearing us out and um, looking forward to being on the panel. So thanks again. Thank you, Leo, very much. And we will come back around with questions after our uh, next and uh, final speaker for this session. Um, so ne next and definitely uh, last and not least is Michelle Young. Um, she's the senior management analyst for Santa Clara County. And, uh, and she'll be speaking on leading jurisdictions perspective and experience. I had the pleasure of getting to know Michelle right when I was beginning my work with the Association of Compost Producers, because we had heard through the grapevine, and this was back in the early 2000s, that uh, Michelle Young uh, was kind of one of the state experts on compost marketing from the municipal perspective, which to me kind of blew my mind. So in, in one of... Um, one of our annual meetings, we, uh, she was able to come down and educate all of us composters about how they do their programs. And so she's still in that business and uh, is leading, um, leading uh, compost procurement for the county of Santa Clara, even though she, at the time, she was working with San Jose. And then she's done a tour of duty in in the wastewater world as well. So I'd like to give you Michelle Young. Okay, thanks so much, Dan. Um, can you confirm that you can see a PowerPoint presentation on the screen? Uh, not yet. Um, have yes. you? Uh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Well, <laughs> excellent. Uh, Technology is always a fun part of these uh, collaborations. Well, again, thank you so much. Um, Thank you to the Association of Compost Producers and to the EPA for inviting me to share what I'm going to call my 30-year iteration. Um, as Craig mentioned, uh, he and I worked together in the 90s um, with some of the initial research on, on local farms in Santa Clara County um, because what we believed then and still do kind of uh, dovetails onto what um, Senator Allen was talking about, which was a uh, producer responsibility. So in the 90s, San Jose came to believe that because they were generating um, all this yard waste material, they should be helping to develop the market. Uh, we were maybe a little bit ahead of the curve at that point, but uh, it's been a wild ride um, of starting with agriculture. And, and again, as um, Craig mentioned um, working on specific markets such as landscaping, erosion control, and now um, into the jurisdiction use. So this is the long game. It's it's an ongoing conversation, even though 1383 has created a new um, a new driver. Um, this has been a longstanding conversation and will continue to to. Uh, enjoy new iterations as we, for example, learn uh, better ways to make energy out of these bioresources and things like that. So um, ongoing conversation, but SB 1383 is definitely gonna change the landscape. And I'm thinking that's a t-shirt. So I have to talk to, to Cal Recycle about, about that so we can get those shirts going. Um, so I wanna talk about a couple of things today, but. I kind of want to, you know, being this case study part of the funnel um, conversation that we've been having, sort of focus a little more on how jurisdictions are bringing their specific resources to this conversation. So we've been talking through all the presentations about how we all collaborate as public agencies, private agencies, uh, um, nonprofits, et cetera. So just as a reminder of some of the things that you've already heard, um, 
Jurisdictions have a key role in this conversation in terms of generating funding through customer rates or general funds, various different um, funding sources that they use to implement their goals and uh, policies, as well as being a regulatory agency, which means they are um, implementing state and federal regulations. We have direct conduits to residents and businesses. So we are doing ongoing outreach um, to, to the sectors within our jurisdictions, and that's an important part of the process. Um, as it has been mentioned, um, it's really important, and the jurisdictions have a key role in linking to the other strategic efforts that are going on in the jurisdictions. And there's many different, but just a couple that have been mentioned, climate action plans, zero waste plans, we have our sustainable agriculture plan, uh, and things like that. So um, jurisdictions can help to connect all those conversations to create more import for funding and policy and program development. Um, also support of pilot projects and, and research is important. So uh, again, when Craig and I first started working, we were funding research on farm and it was really exciting times. But you know, if the jurisdictions have these priorities, they can help to not only bring their own funding, but grant funding and other sources. And, um, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, just some high uh, top of mind ideas. But the other, and I'm not gonna talk too much about it today, but it is really important is jurisdictions and their ability to um, create the drivers for infrastructure development. So I'm gonna point to a couple of projects in Santa Clara County, both interestingly enough, are, in the compost world are, are owned by um, Green Waste Recovery. Um, but just to, to take you back in time, this is the ZBES composting facility in Gilroy, one of the largest in the state, <coughs> certainly in Northern California. Um, and while the facility itself uh, was driven and, and funded by the contracts with the jurisdictions to collect yard waste, which used to be just those brown windrows. Now you can see the food waste in the bags. The building that you see circled there was the result of a food waste processing pilot that the city of San Jose uh, funded in 2000. So um, several different processors, Newbie Island and, and ZBest were granted funds to look at what food waste processing might look like. And they chose to build this mixed waste receiving um, infrastructure. Uh, so again, the jurisdictions are helping to give the private sector the vision of where we're going. So this was a pilot long before most jurisdictions actually started to collect food waste um, as a general practice. Uh, and so that's just an idea or example of how those indicators can create real infrastructure. This is another facility, uh, which I was really thrilled to be part of. Uh, in 2014, we did a, an RFP for commercial services for the city of San Jose, and we asked for um, energy generation as a high priority for our contract. And uh, resulted in the proposal and build out of the uh, ZWED high solids anaerobic digester that's in North San Jose. So again, I think this is still one of the largest in the U.S. And it's just an example of the fact that um, both policy and um, and the infrastructure uh, funding and and the franchise agreements and things like that that uh, that are there can be the drivers. For this infrastructure that we're talking about that we that we really need. So I just wanted to highlight that because um, it is something that you see again and again as the uh, impact of jurisdiction, um, jurisdiction contracts, etc. So um, I want to focus in a little bit on a, a case study today. Um, and I am going to focus on the agriculture uh, part of the case study. But again, we've we've looked at a variety of markets today. I just want to focus on this because um, of the time and everything. But um, Santa Clara County uh, in general, uh, 16 cities from Gilroy to Palo Alto, um, south of, of, of uh, San Francisco, uh, we do have a very mature compost and mulch market. 
um, not just because of the work that uh, Craig and I have done now. <laughs> um, mo most of the cities in the area have been very um, proactive um, about um, getting their material onto land, both in the jurisdictions and outside. Um, so it is a very um, mature market. We don't have a JPA, but the 15 cities do collaborate with funding under a waste commission. And so there's some funding that's available for countywide projects, but in many cases, it's a jurisdiction by jurisdiction um, project. We do a lot of collaboration. Um, for example, with the, the funding that has been coming out through the state um, for the local assistance grants, all the cities have come together to share ideas on the best ways to spend that money for long-term benefit. So that's an example of how um, the, the cities are working together uh, under the Technical Advisory uh, Committee. Um, the unincorporated county, um, which I now uh, help to manage the contracts for, has a small population. It's a variety of pockets throughout the county, but we have a couple of benefits, including the large land area um, in the South County um, agricultural land, but also the county manages the agriculture program. We collaborate with Cooperative Extension. Um, the county is managing the climate action plan. So the county is, is in this case study, a little bit of a hub for all the 16 cities. And so we're trying to really leverage that as well. And you saw a very similar table from Craig for San Diego County. So you're gonna see Santa Clara County, 154, 155,000 tons of, of um, organic material needs to be procured each year. Now, as Craig mentioned, at the moment, most of this is being planned as compost and, and mulch procurement. As the other markets developed, and that's important for this group to keep thinking about, but as the fuel and energy markets um, get a little more um, well-developed, then the cities are definitely keeping an eye on that as well. But at the moment, uh, most of the cities are looking to, um, to procure compost. So again, we've, we've heard this in the other presentations. We have opportunities for market development, research, infrastructure development, and, and collaboration. And I know that many jurisdictions, when you, when you say the word SB 1383 procurement, the vision that they have or the immediate reaction is, it's so big, there's so much to be done. We see the barriers, we see the challenges. But in the 30 years I've been working in the solid waste industry, I have never seen the level of collaboration that we're seeing now. So there's a lot of positive change that I think is going to, to help solve those challenges. And um, that's a really important aspect of this legislation. So in Santa Clara County, we developed a procurement work group, a uh, countywide work group in 2020, because obviously the, the regulations are more than just the organic materials. There's also copy paper and other materials that have to be purchased by the counties. So um, there's a lot that, that goes on, um, but we have not only updated our procurement policy, but we've developed guidelines and training for our staff, the enforceable mechanism, I throw that in because that's a term that CalRecycle uses. Um, and legally, it's the contract. So we've created contract appendices that say any contract that uh, is entered, entered into by the county has to meet SB 1383 procurement standards. So if there is um, a compost project, then it has to meet the specifications of 1383. But those are the enforceable mechanisms that the, the law requires. And so we've built those. Um, we're, we're getting ready to release our RFP for our solid waste franchise. And we've put in an option for proposers to tell us how they would support the procurement um, portion of our requirement. Um, we have a sustainable landscaping um, program in, uh, in the county. And so we've been working with them to make sure we're maximizing the use of material on county lands. Um, and and the projects that are already um, underway. But as Leo mentioned, uh, in most jurisdictions that I've talked to, there is not enough land area in, in the, especially urban areas, to put all the material they're required to buy on, on city projects or even county projects. So um, 
that is uh, that's a critical uh, thing to consider as well. But what I want to delve into is the expansion of our agricultural grant program. So even before 1383, the county had what's called the Agricultural Resiliency Incentive Grant Program. So the grant program um, has 27 pre-approved um, practices that um, farmers can get involved in, which include windbreaks and uh, cover cropping and things like that, um, up to $30,000 per grant. And um, Leo mentioned the Comet Planner, that is the, the evaluation tool that we use. So we are granting these, um, we're rate, rating these um, applications based on cost per um, ton of carbon dioxide. So it is directly related to the climate benefit of these um, practices, whatever they may be. And um, then Cooperative Extension, UC Cooperative Extension, uh, actually they're housed at the county and um, work under a contract with the county. So they have been doing all the tech support and the direct work with the farmers. Um, and they've been able to, through language support and other things, really focus on small and minority farms, which is amazing. Um, but they have a concern already that as we expand the, the uh, number of projects, they're getting mired down a little bit in the administrative part of this, the implementation. So as Leo mentioned, the criticality of record keeping and, and all the, the documents that the state requires uh, for this provision. So uh, we definitely have noticed that. But really one of the biggest things that has happened is the, the board, uh, uh, the County Board of Supervisors has approved an ongoing general fund allocation of $320,000 per year. And this is why. Because these projects link, they connect a lot of the dots that are really important to these boards, and they represent a benefit to the broader public. So um, one of the things that I think is important is that we don't just look at the garbage rate payers as the folks that should pay for for um, procurement of organic materials, right? It's a It's a community benefit and should therefore be spread across the community in terms of funding. So because um, the activities in the grant program are linked to climate action, as well as business and economic development and ecosystem services, they, they granted this as a viable um, expenditure from the general fund. So this is a really important um, model. And as I say to everybody, anything I mention in the presentation, I just invite you to call and say, hey, let me see the memo for that. What did you say to the board? How did you get that money? Or let me see what your contracts look like. So anything I mention is, is open for sharing. Um, but this was really important because it does give us a base for a very large percentage of the material that we have to buy every year. But more importantly than that, it brings this up to this level of community benefit. It's not just um, agriculture. It's not just a solid waste issue. It's a it's a climate and economic and ecosystem issue that's important, uh, that's, that's deemed to be critical for the county. So just a couple of highlights here. Um, it, we've had two years of grants so far. We're in our second year, I should say. Um, the first year was a little lower, 200,000. Uh, we had 64 applicants for a total of $1.3 million. So you can see that the demand is there. The farmers are very interested in this and we had more applications than we could grant. Um, we granted 12 um, grantees and in 2022, we put down um, a, about 1,200 tons of compost. But you have to remember that the, most of these are two to three year grants. So over the years, we're going to see um, the full rollout of, of those tons each year. So um, it will be a multiplier as we have the, uh, the different years rolling out. In 2023, we had a little more money. And the reason that there's that 20000 that's not in the grant bucket is because that's administrative funding. So we had a few, few less applicants, um, but still a very strong application pool. 
um, of 42 applications for $652,000. We awarded 11 awardees. And you can see some of the statistics here um, that most of the applications include co compost and mulch. A um, lot of small farms, right? And and these are our field applications. So these are um, uh, vegetable growers and, and uh, vineyards and, and tree crops, et cetera. So um, really good response. But again, we're looking for how to make this more efficient and how to leverage other resources. So we've been keeping our eye on what's going on and we started to see um, cities around the state and in our county very interested in the zero food print compost connector. This was actually even before the compost connector was a thing, but we've been um, interacting with zero food print for quite a while. And they actually um, worked with us on the development of the ARI project. Uh, and so we've been sharing resources for a while. But what we did is we wanted to leverage some of our local assistance grant funds to create a, um, a resource that would be longer running. You know, so you could you could take the money and just spend it on compost. But we also wanted to build a resource that could be shared with the other cities and used over time resource. So for the grant funding that we contributed, we, we are going to, uh, we bought uh, 1,200 tons of compost um, for 2023, just to see how that worked and then see the whole process with zero food print. But we also had um, paid to create the compost connector for use by other county cities. So we're already seeing that adoption take place and folks are very interested and they can sort of see how the model works. And we're hoping that that will um, reduce a barrier for other cities in the county to uh, enter into an agreement with Zero Food Print and use the tool. And finally, we wanted to look at our ARI program and the Zero Food Print program management to see the benefits, right? And so um, we are um, expanding the um, that program and uh, we see a lot of benefits um, by using the zero food print agreement to kind of expand what we're doing with the um, Ag Resiliency Incentive Program. So we can um, use compost on local lands or statewide farms. They both meet jurisdiction compliance. So we do have one of our cities that's using zero food print and most of their purchases took place in Southern California, actually San Diego and areas like that, right? So they don't have to buy them locally, but many cities might say, we prefer to have it local because that sells better with our council or what have you. So there's an opportunity for both there, which expands our local model. Um, and this can also to, um, support less developed markets um, where they haven't been spending 30 years to talk to farmers. So by supporting, um, the applications in, in less developed markets, we're, we're expanding the experience that farmers have with compost and developing the demand in those areas. As Leo mentioned, we have an advantage with Zero Food Print to um, leverage funding sources. So that's always interesting and important for um, elected officials to know that ratepayer funds and public funds are being leveraged with other uh, sources, crowdsources, grants, et cetera. We're also seeing from the initial data, we don't have enough data to, to confirm this, but from our initial look, the, the dollars per ton applied is a little bit lower with zero food print for a couple of reasons. One, um, because of administrative costs, costs, but also the ARI grant because it's a um, $30,000 granted to the farmer they may go into a little more of the other costs like application and other things like that. So we may be paying for more of the project, which is not a bad thing, but when we're looking at tons that need to be applied under the rule, we wanna make sure we can explain to the um, elected officials how we're, um, how we're doing that. So we're looking at the efficiencies of using zero food print, but it looks like it's, um, cost per 10 for procurement under SB 1383 
more efficient. And um, the other really big thing that we're looking at is the administrative benefits. So zero food print, you've seen this image uh, from Leo, they have figured out how to do this. It's a very user-friendly process for the farmers. And I will tell you just as anecdotally, um, I tried to get, I, I, we don't have the data yet from the ARI program, from the county program, but I already know exactly how many tons have been sold to each farmer in the zero food print process. It's very transparent and um, it's easy for me to see exactly where we are at any time during the year, which is um, going to be important because let's say we get to October and we haven't met our procurement target. It means we need to do some other procurement. But with the ARI program, those records don't come in from the farmers till later. So um, there's some advantages there in terms of um, record keeping, et cetera, and uh, the ability to keep cooperative extension really focused on tech support, et cetera. So we're really feeling like this is a good model and we're already talking about shifting our ARI funding into um, management by zero food print. So as a case study, this has been a really valuable um, pilot um, test. The other thing I, I will mention is that under the contract we have with Zero Food Print, they're going to come back to um, our TAC commission of all 16 cities and really report out on what we learned this year, what's available to them, and how they can use the program. So that's another one of the deliverables. That's really excellent. And in closing, you know, I just um, want to, you know, end with the opportunity for everybody in this room, um, and myself included. Um, there's a lot of industry opportunities um, for S with SB 1383. Um, your, your goal as an alliance is to find the best end uses for um, organic materials. And now you have jurisdictions that are actually sometimes for the first time figuring out where their organics go. They're touring compost facilities. They're really becoming aware of what their options are. They're looking at energy technologies and power purchase agreements. So it's really changing the norm and the narrative for jurisdictions to get into this conversation in potentially a new way. Um, budgets are being developed for organic diversion and um, procurement. So um, the jurisdictions are looking for resources that exist in alliances like this to help them understand what's optimum, what's new, what, what they should be looking at, what they should be piloting, et cetera. Um, and as I mentioned before, areas where there's mature markets and funding already, they can help to support the developing markets throughout the state where we might need a little more case study on the ground. And so I think that's a real benefit and, and also a pilot and research options. So this communication that we have between the Alliance and the public sector is really valuable because your expertise on the technical side and mixed with our um, regulatory and, and customer focus uh, can really help to move the needle for the next 30 years. So I'll talk to you again in 30 years and we'll see where we are then. Okay, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Michelle, um, very much. Uh, I'll begin with one uh, hopefully quick question uh, while um, I think um, Hussein is going to uh, spotlight all three of you for the question and answer period. Yes, good, you're already there. Um, my first question, and I'm not sure I heard you right, Michelle, but you said um, uh, the use of paid compost connector for other cities I wasn't sure how that worked in terms of bridging the compost connector with your other jurisdictions in your yeah. collaboration. And, and that's exactly what the pilot is about. So that's a perfect question. Uh, what we've done uh, with Zero Food Print is we built the compost connector so that all 16 cities in Santa Clara County can use it. It's open to them. They can all go click in there and see what it looks like. And then what they would do, and they're already doing, so we're already seeing some add-on. I think we just added Mountain View and some others are looking at it as well. Then they would need to enter into a very simple agreement 
with um, zero food print. But the advantage is each jurisdiction does not need to build a new compost connector. Like they don't have to do that part of it. So by, by creating a tool that could be used by any of the 16 cities, they have a smaller barrier to entry, if you will. So um, that's really the idea. So each city would enter into an agreement with zero food print based on the fund that they have and how much they want to subsidize. And they would use the same tool and um, then we would promote it on the back end. So one thing I didn't mention is that we're all those farmers that may, might have applied and not gotten a grant. Those are the folks that we're promoting to get into the, to the zero food print program. So we advertise to them, here's another tool you can use. And we sent them there. And immediately, I think within a month, we granted all of the awards in Santa Clara County. So the cities are now seeing that it could be a really local benefit. Taking a council member to a farm that they've helped to fund, those are really powerful um, local options. Great. Do you, um, Leo or, um, or Craig, have anything to add to that in your experience? Because I know, Craig, you've worked with Leo's group with Zero Food Print right. as well. Right, and I didn't. Uh, I knew Leo was going to be covering that, but yeah, we've been actively involved with their food print right from the beginning here in San Diego County with various farms, and and also uh, that last mile I mentioned during my talk is really a critical component of of the procurement process. In that, if you if you don't have the equipment or know where to go, uh, or it's too costly to apply it, oftentimes it can become an obstacle to the procurement. So we've been partnering with the collaboration we talk about. We've been partnering with uh, Food Corporation, is uh, one of the companies that produces blower units that can be literally attached to a pickup truck to apply the compost mulch or the materials uh, on slopes in vineyards. And the uh, other company is owned by the same. It's a counter to Finn. They're, they're separate companies owned by the same people, and that's uh, Express Blowers. Uh, that they're larger, they produce larger blower units. But these are companies that have technology for applying material. But then we're also looking at manure spreaders, and we're getting funding uh, from organizations and that uh, the San Diego Foundation to help us acquire equipment of uh, manure spreaders that can apply uh, composted mulch in vineyards and the narrow rows. Uh, so we're using every available resource we can find to close that la that loop, close that last mile and give uh, people and jurisdictions the tools they need to be successful. And one of the worst things you can do to people is ask them to do something and then not provide the tools for them to be successful doing it. So that's the big challenge I think that's ahead of us. Sarah Foodprint's been a, just a breath of fresh air in terms of the logistics everything that Michelle has been doing, all of that uh, collectively, and then the collaboration. I, I think if I had to end with one comment is, is what Michelle said, the importance of collaboration between the pro public and private sector is absolutely essential to the success of this program and to the, and to the welfare of our planet. Great, thanks. Are there, uh, before we have a, a few um, number of questions actually in the Q and A, is there anybody in the room first since you spent your time and energy to be here? Did you have any questions for this particular panel, or shall we move right to the Q and A online? Okay, nobody's right, jumping up. So, um, Kevin, if you could go ahead and read the questions, and then the panel can respond to them. Sure. Uh, I think we have about six minutes left uh, to do four questions online, so it might be a little bit tight, uh, but we'll try for it. Um, the first question uh, is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, livestock wastewater is 4x uh, greater than residential wastewater, yet wastewater budget for treating livestock wastewater is only 1% of the residential wastewater treatment budget. Uh, obviously, we all fear salmonella, E. coli, et cetera, to... Uh, uh, infects, you know, food stream, groundwater, et cetera. Um, yet we don't fund it sufficiently. Uh, maybe our food waste uh, should be replaced by livestock waste in the budgets and we can give food waste to feed animals or insect farms 
um, such as BSF that would provide high quality feed for livestock? Is there any possibility of getting this approach in place? Interesting. That's a big question. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at it that being a, a, the last dairy left in San Diego County, we uh, upcycle into dairy products, particularly butter, about 2,000 tons of uh, food waste, uh, much of it coming from the microbrewery industry, 18 microbreweries in San Diego, uh, uh -huh. factories and bakeries. And um, part of part of the, so that supports the dairy and then the runoff, uh, if you will, or when we uh, clean the, dairy, the cows and that during milking process, uh, all of that runoff goes into a, a retention basin that we use to irrigate our pastures to also feed the cows and support the development of their of the heifers, the the younger younger cows before they become uh, milk producing. So, you, there is a way to close the loop. Uh, I do believe livestock production can be an extremely valuable tool that we've kind of pushed out of these urban environments, but uh, in many respects can be uh, a real valuable tool for uh, repurposing some of the wastewater, what have you, that could come from food waste and what have you, uh, just depending on how much we can divert. As we put, we used to have over 200 dairies, we only have one left, so uh, we are limited in our capacity, but uh, I suspect those, that's an active area that we should be exploring further. I think it's a great question. Yeah, it is, I will just add. Yeah, just to add, uh, yeah, I would just add, you know, reiterate that and that what we have looked at that. And, and as Craig mentioned, we do have an animal feed um, option from one of our urban cities. Uh, and this question does come up. Why are we not taking that food waste and feeding it to hogs? Well, a lot of them live in Iowa. I mean, there's just the, the scale of animal operations as compared to the scale of yeah. food waste that we're generating. It, yeah both the scale and the infrastructure, when you look at the amount of material movement, um, you know, to get that to small operations all around, it, it's not very efficient. We happen to have a feed manufacturer in Santa Clara. You know, they're a very unique solid waste operation, but they're taking waste from a very tiny city. If you started to get to LA, <laughs> San Jose, <laughs> San Diego, it's too much. It would inundate yeah. any um, animal feed system. So um, while I think that's important to still keep looking at, and we're we're looking at that in Santa Clara County, um, it's it's a much higher cost for the residents to collect that clean food. And if it's not really locally produced, your infrastructure costs would um, outweigh the benefits and potentially the carbon benefits if you've got to move material all over. So yeah. it's, it's just a very complex system, but always yeah. worth doing that where we can do it. Yeah, and, and the AD facilities prefer uh, food waste to landscape waste in terms of the energy they can produce in terms of biofuel. So uh, AD facilities are becoming a, a, a real possibility for handling that amount of food waste that's coming from these populated centers. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about uh, the wastewater treatment plants as opposed to high solids facilities? Uh, more uh, solids facilities, yeah. I'm thinking... Yeah, if we if we develop the infrastructure for solids, AD, yeah. that's awesome. But we, we spent so many years looking at the possibility of putting that into the wastewater system and just taking solids to liquid and then mm. back to... It's just that you lose all the energy that you generate in, okay. in doing that. So... You know, we offered that as a part of the RFP in 2013. Mm. We had 16 digesters available for proposers. None of the solid waste people would touch it because it's just, oh, really? it's a losing proposition. There are mm. some, there are some that are taking it in, but you've got to slurry it and et cetera, et cetera. And then you still have a waste product. It's fun and complicated. It's complicated. It's fun. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to address any more questions right now. Um, as you can see, this is an ongoing process. Everybody talks about the future, which is the present. And um, we're implementing a bioresource asset um, inventory for every county. Um, and that, that 
and that's already doing that's already what uh, zero food print is in the middle of so this is work for us into the future to build these new markets we're now going to take a uh, so a quick uh, heads up to uh, thank you to the three panelists there uh, with the three remaining questions uh, you can actually dive into the q and a if you'd like to look at them all three of them are actually soil carbon flux related uh, different aspects from no till to yeah. how yeah, yeah. Um, so that would be, and you could just type the answer in there if, if you feel so inclined would be uh, much appreciated. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, so uh, this will be the end of this session. Um, we will be taking a 15 minute break, uh, coming back at 1130 uh, and doing a, a shortened uh, one hour session for my session seven, uh, 1130 to 1230. And then we'll have our lunch uh, 1230 to 130 and get back on schedule. Obviously, uh, thank you for accommodating the shift uh, to be able to incorporate Senator Allen into today's uh, um, agenda. So uh, thanks for accommodating and we will see you back at 1130 for a one hour session. Uh, thank thanks, you again. Thanks everyone. Right, bye. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Break time. <laughs>
Which one? The yellow? Yeah, they're both gray. I'm impressed. I didn't realize the person in the minority here. Okay, we'll get started with session seven. And uh, session seven is on um, emissions reductions. And to moderate it is uh, Kevin Esslinger, who is carbs, ca cows, and car people person. So here's Kevin. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. I think I'm on camera. Uh, we are good to start. All right, so thanks for uh, joining us back after a little break. And we'll be doing a little shortened session, uh, 11.30 to 12.30 to get us uh, a full hour of lunch. And this is session seven, uh, emission reductions and biomass cost economics. And as Lauren mentioned, um, my specialization, I'm UC Davis double masters. I have a, a master's in animal science, uh, focusing on cattle environmental management and uh, in the transportation side of things, I did a lot of energy systems, um, alternative fuels uh, at UC Davis. So uh, that's my background uh, academically. And then I've been at CARB for 16 years, uh, working basically as I feel like an inside consultant thing, CARB. Anytime there's a dairy question that comes up, people um, will pull in me and a couple other of my colleagues to, to weigh in and um, and then on the, uh, I had for years done the greenhouse gas inventory for transportation. So, uh, and our first speaker uh, is a professor that I've worked with for years uh, at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. It's uh, Dr. Mike McCola, um, and he's a professor of agribusiness and a senior economist at ERA Economics. He teaches courses focused on da data analysis, research methods, and applied economics. Dr. McCullough received his PhD in economics and a master's in statistics from Washington State University. His research interests deal with California production, agriculture, including the regulatory environment currently faced by producers, as well as economics and policy of beer and wine. So it's a little fun uh, application. Uh, current research projects span from an assessment on regulatory costs on specialty crops to the effects of climate change and water policy on rural communities. And uh, I will hand it off to Dr. McCullough and later we'll introduce Kevin Barnes before he starts his two talks. So uh, take it away. Thanks so much. Getting closer to the screen. Um, so you can see me. I'd like, I've got some slides to share. If you can open that up for me. There we go. Perfect. Awesome. Um, so I've been working with with Kevin, like he like he mentioned, for a number of years now, and primarily on the clean um, California Clean Biomass Collaborative, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but briefly, and I I really wanted to kind of take a step back and think about things from a high level, from kind of a teaching and economic perspective, and I'm really thankful that that this session is following the last because I think they touched on a lot of points. And I think their approach is is in line with the things that I want to talk about today, um, in particular for dealing with agricultural biomass uh, residue and waste streams. And so I'll jump into it. Uh, one thing I do want to say is that these uh, what I'm going to talk about is my opinion and and doesn't doesn't reflect anything official from CARB or from the California government and uh, and uh, and that this has been supported through CARB. So a little outline of um, the discussion here that I'd like to start and think about is just some background, a little update on on where where we're at now. Um, think about some lessons learned over the last few years, and then and then, like I said, get into the principles, economic principles of optimal input use and optimal use to think about how kind of set the stage for how we could think about. Uh, viable pathways for a lot of this biomass and then think about a path forward both immediate and look towards the future so the 
California Clean Biomass Collaborative was born out of the phase out of agricultural burning in the uh, San Joaquin Valley. And so this was something that was set to happen uh, quite a while ago and is being implemented right now. So we're about halfway through it. And I think 2025, 26 will be no more agriculture burning at all. Things are being phased out based on size and based on your ability and availability of, of taking care of this biomass in other ways. Um, one of our projects and one of the thoughts and the patterns that we were going through with the collaborative is to think about you know, what does the supply chain look like for this particular type of biomass? And in particular, we're thinking about um, whole orchards um, being taken out or vineyards being taken out. That's, that's the primary primary types of biomass that, that were being burned and are being phased out. And there's a couple of reasons for this, you know, all, all orchard prunings and clippings, and vineyard prunings and clippings are being reincorporated or being used in other places. But when you take out, you know, a couple hundred acres of, of walnuts or almonds, you have to deal with it. And, and that load has typically been burned. And then for vineyards, depending on how you pruning those vineyards, and training those vineyards over the uh, over the trestle system that they can grow around the metal. And so the easiest way to get rid or to separate that stuff out was to burn it. Um, and those are the, those are the primary types of biomasses that we're thinking about and talking about and uh, we're wondering about in this case. So how are those how could those things be used in different ways? And that was our task and what we went through and we're looking at. And our primary lessons that we learned, and I think is probably fairly obvious to everyone here, is that not all of those biomasses, not all biomasses are created equal, right? There's different technological use. It's, um, as we just heard about, you know, putting woody biomass into an anaerobic digester is not as easy to do. It's not as, as uh, uh, efficient, energy efficient, as opposed to liquids. And, you know, so there's that part the availability of them is uh, really important. And in particular for this situation, where that stuff, where that biomass is located might be out in the middle of a field that has no access from dirt roads and you've got, you know, large culverts or, or, or ditches that you have to drive over to, to get through. And uh, so it's not readily available. It's not close. And then transporting it is not cheap. And that's, that's what we found is probably gonna be the number one point. And again, goes right back to the, the last session. And I think they had some really good solutions for that. And then how clean it is, right? And that, that goes to the vineyards. Um, having metal shards in the biomass does lend itself well for certain types of use. On that same point, not all biomass conversion pathways are created equal, right? There's, there's different uh, pathways have different abilities to convert the biomass into other into things. There's scale implementation issues, and um, and then there's differences in greenhouse gas mitigation, the criteria pollutant uh, mitigation, and then what I want to think about today is that that lends itself to differences in economic costs and benefits. Um, coming out of that, I think what we have to take into account and what we need to think about is that you know given these different uses given the fact that biomasses and biomass use pathways have different benefits and costs we understand that that the uh, uh, the stakeholders in the game have different objectives that they're all trying to maximize and we have to be aware about that and take that into account so for the agricultural producers their objective is to get rid of this waste stream for them at at the least cost pathway right and that's what they've been doing in burning or in chipping and soil incorporation or composting. The biomass conversion providers want to maximize profits. And, and whether that's, you know, whether you're a, a, a you know, general company and corporation that's that's selling, trying to maximize profits, or a nonprofit organization, that's still your goal, right? You want to do the business the best you can. And so you're going to look towards those biomass inputs to be, you know, what's the cheapest input, what's the closest input that I can get. And that's not always going to be the stuff that's coming from 
uh, vineyards, orchards, and whatnot. And then from an environmental justice perspective or, or societal perspective, we're, we're trying to minimize any externalities, right? We're trying to reduce those pollutants as much as possible. And so taking all of those into perspective, I thought a good use of time would be just to go back to, to our basic economics and think about that principle of optimal use or optimal input use. And, and what we have are two different trade-offs. We've got the trade-off in a pathway's ability to reduce pollution or reduce greenhouse gases. And that's what we've got on top here is that this concept known as the marginal rate of technical substitution. And it bas basically says that there's there's going to be different abilities, like we talked about, for these different pathways to to create energy or to reduce green, greenhouse gas, right? You can combust this biomass in an air curtain burner, or you could take the biomass and go through pyrolysis or gasification or digestion, and it create, you know, has got different outcomes. And that's that marginal rate of technical substitution. All of those pathways also have a cost involved, and that's that relative price or relative cost. And that theory of optimal use says that the ratio of these needs to be equal across all types of pathways. And this really comes back to that point that was mentioned in the last, the last session that you need to be looking at where your biggest bang for your buck is, right? What's the ability to reduce greenhouse gas or criteria pollutants relative to the cost of that pathway? And this is going to be true regardless of whether you're trying to minimize costs to get to some given level of greenhouse gas reductions or whether you're trying to maximize your reductions for a given cost, right? So if you've got $30,000 to grant, you want to do it in the best way. And so those are those two points that we always got to be considering and when we're thinking about moving forward and when we're thinking about setting policy for how we might incentivize people to move forward. We want to think about the marginal reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and criteria pollutants and, 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 and environmental impacts. And we want to think of the marginal cost to that use and those relative there. And so this brings me to this recent study by Fuhrer and Smith et al. Um, from, from Davis that looked at multiple biomass uses across multiple types of biomass feedstocks. They did a really good job in synthesizing hundreds of um, scientific peer-reviewed journal articles and looking at what are the implications on greenhouse gas emissions and criteria pollutants. And they've come up with a bunch of scores on saying whether this has got net positive or net negative on these two accounts. And for us, we're really interested in this agricultural residue. And you can see the one negative on this list is unspecified burning. And that's what's been the status quo. And that's what we're moving away for. And then we've got either white bars where there's no information or no good literature on it, or the, or the green points where we're saying that it's either positive and positive returns for greenhouse gas emissions in this case, or um, or neutral, and then the same thing for criteria pollutants. Again, uh, unspecified burning is very negative; it's harmful. Uh, but there are multiple pathways that have positive positive attributes, or, or or we don't know at least on the marginal benefit side. So if we list all of these out and think about these pathways and say, okay, these are pathways from the marginal product perspective or, or their ability to change and to mitigate um, an environmental impacts, we need to think about, well, what's the cost of these? And so we can go down this list and think about where from, from a societal perspective should we be thinking about where we need to be funding or where we need to be directing funds. And there's four of that list, four immediate pathways, I think that for me stand out. And there's pathways, those pathways are what everyone's been talking about, which is great. Um, biomass combustion for power, composting, conversion um, to biogas through AD, and then um, application for biochar from combustion. There's a lot of good research on all of these. There's a lot of really good papers showing that the benefits of these, and then what we really need to think about, well, what are those costs? Um, biomass controlled combustion for power, this is what's been phased out 
we don't have a lot of these plants left anymore, or at least in operation anymore. But there, um, what Freer Smith had found that 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 the net benefit from doing this is is quite substantial from the status quo, and um, and if we think about it from a cost per benefit perspective, uh, with investments in retrofitting these plants and carbon capture they have the potential to really, really do a good job in handling the particular biomass that we're talking about here from orchards and vineyards. Especially, especially since, you know, whether, you know, burning is phased out. I want to point the other, the, the other side of things is that a lot of that biomass, if you drive up and down the valley, is just sitting there. And so it's just open air decomposition, which is also not something we want because of pollutants that it creates through, through that. Um, composting and ana anaerobic digestion, where we've seen some really great success uh, in the dairy industry for when we separate out and go through digestion and then composting with the solids separated, some, some reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, which has been fantastic. And then a reduction in the reliance on synthetic fertilizers. And all of those dairies have to manage farms as well. Those farms have to buy fertilizers to to um, to grow the crops, and not relying on fossil fuel derived synthetic fertilizers is a fantastic thing, especially if we can get it from these waste streams. Um, but we did hear the issues with converting, you know, woody biomass through AD, and so there's some some issues and and funding mechanisms that we might want to figure out to see if this is a viable pathway. And then biomass. Uh, controlled combustion via air curtain burner to create bio biochar is seeing uh, um, some really really neat things going on. Neat research going on. It's in, it's it's a great potential. Um, the air curtain burner signif significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions and criteria pollutants given their design from the status quo. Um, they're cheap to manufacture. The classes across across the street from me here at Cal Poly. In the ag engineering department, they're building them, and so they build them every quarter here. Uh, you can get these around easily. You can hook them up to the trailer of a pickup, and uh, and so they're able to be brought out. Um, there's also a lot of really neat research going on about showing how the biochar created from from this type of combustion or other things being included in composting significantly increases the impact of composting from an environmental perspective and um, and from a crop health or soil health perspective, which is really neat. So a few things to think about um, as, as, as an end uh, here. Uh, I, the first one is looking at all of, all of these different pathways. The highest cost portion of it is extraction and transportation. And what the last session really talked about was the last mile and and some really neat ways of figuring out how to how to fix that from a logistics perspective in the last mile but it's also first mile issue and that's what we're talking about here it's that first mile so how do we get that biomass out of the field to a place that can process it in a way other than processing it on site through something like an air curtain burner we know if we're thinking about that ratio of the marginal benefit to the cost, that from a pol policy perspective, from a technological perspective, we can alter that bottom, we can alter that price point right here. And I, I absolutely love, from an educational standpoint, I love hearing people on the ground doing the work talking about how they're looking at what's the bang for our buck, what's the impact, from like using the Comet program, finding out that impact relative to the dollars spent on that program. It's a, it's, it is the way that economic principles says you should be thinking about things. That's the way that the state ag burn alternatives grant program has been thinking about things. And that is the path forward. Um, last, last thing I want to share and something I've been talking to my natural resource econ class uh, in the last few weeks about is Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning work. And what they did is they looked at all sorts of different societies and, and, and how they manage common properties and common resources. And it's a real similar thing here. And they went down and they documented and they said, listen, there's five, five properties that that management system has to have in order for it to be a viable management system. 
And these are those five things. All of the users have to be involved in devising these rules. There needs to be monitors of the resource. Uh, uh, it's accountable to resource users. And I love seeing these very simple, easy to use programs like, like, the, the, like we saw in the last session where you can take pictures, you can monitor it easily. There's not overly burdensome administration costs. Uh, there needs to be rec mechanisms to resolve conflicts and um, at, at, at low costs. And then these rules have to be adaptable to local conditions. And that's a really good point as well. It's not a one size fits all. All of these biomasses have different uses um, and, and we should be thinking about how we can do this in a broad way and let those best uses per dollar spent rise to the top. And um, and then think about how we can, you know, from the, from the, from the from a stick perspective, uh, how we how we handle that in terms of sanctions and get people on board is start low and have graduate graduated um, um, impacts or sanctions from from violators. Those are my thoughts um, from from the perspective of handling that biomass and uh, and uh, and moving forward. I'm happy to answer any questions when we have time. Thanks a bunch. All right. Thank you so much for the presentation. I definitely have some uh, questions that I'll uh, save till uh, both presenters are done. But um, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Professor McCullough. So now I will introduce uh, Kevin Barnes, our second speaker. And luckily, uh, uh, he has such a, a long career and knowledge base in multiple things that he was actually able to take over doing a presentation for someone who couldn't make it. So. Uh, we're doing a, a second presentation uh, from Kevin as well. So uh, Kevin Barnes has managed solid waste and recycling systems uh, for over 40 years. He grew up in a family trash company, merged it with a corporate waste firm, and later managed two city waste departments. Uh, during his 25 years at the solid, as a solid waste director for the city of Bakersfield, he built and operated the largest public composting facility in California. So this is definitely where rubber meets the road. So <laughs> uh, very lucky to have Kevin here. Um, the facility is known for its efficiency and many advanced projects, including electrification, automation, and water conservation. In 2012, Kevin assembled a team of compost industry professionals to create a solution for the challenge of VOC emission rules in the Central Valley. And he is now retired from public service and provides consulting services. And we very much appreciate him coming. So I will get him set up on the uh, presentation mode real quick by turning on my camera. I'm glad you're pressing the buttons. Yeah. And <laughs> And we got uh, your first presentation, share. And when you get your second one up, um, I'm happy to help with that too. Mm -hmm. That's, and... Thank you, Kevin. Uh, you got two Kevins here and two presentations from this Kevin. So it's very confusing, I'm sure. I'm gonna really rush through this because I, I know we're way behind schedule. So I'm gonna go very, very fast, but uh, you can see my contact info here. I've got a QR code at the end if you wanna look me up later. Um, you know, when you're in a variety show and they say now for something completely different, this is probably it. Okay, what are we talking about? Thinner landfill gas. Uh, one of the duties I had in my waste director job was to manage an old landfill. And landfills uh, that generate gas will eventually, um, just just wear out and, and the gas is gone and you have to manage ever thinning gas. And that's a problem. If, if you know anybody in the landfill trade, you can talk to them about it. Um, let's see, we have something over my idle here, Kevin. Um, I can't read my notes, sorry. Change that. Oh, the yeah. X, thank you. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna draw on two situations here. The landfill situation, which is when all this 1383 effort that we're about in the symposium uh, comes to fruition, which, and there's a lot of great energy going forward. This is great progress. Um, we have to think ahead, okay? Um, and, and that's what this is about. What's, what's our landfill management gonna be like next? Because we won't get every ounce of food out. Um, I don't 
think you might agree with that. Uh, I'm also going to tie in the water situation. I work with a consulting firm uh, now. I do the solid waste composting consulting stuff. But uh, we do civil uh, agriculture and wastewater treatment uh, consulting up and down California. And one of the tasks that the firm has asked me to do is figure out a way to get rid of salt from desalination. Um, and not desalination at the coast, but why am I not advancing here? But um, in the Central Valley, actually, uh, for the brackish groundwater, uh, we have a couple of towns that we're, we're working for to desalinate brackish groundwater, and those residues have to go somewhere. Uh, when you're on the coast, you pipe it out to the ocean, with, if you can do enough EIR work. Uh, but if you're in the Central Valley, what do you do? You truck it up to somewhere like Oakland and put it in the plant there. So there's limited stuff there. So this is about bringing a convergence of, of two fields, two problems together, okay? Um, landfill gas capture, it's not quite this simple, like the stock uh, picture. Um, it's, I'm going to use a little better illustration. Here's one I borrowed from Orange County Waste Management from their website, only because I like their art. It was helpful. Uh, I didn't have time to make my own artwork. So there's nothing about Orange County. They're great. Um, but let's zoom in on this. You can see on the left, uh, landfill gas system represented by the dashed lines. On the right, you see trash cells with no landfill gas system. Well, guess what? They've got the gas system in place on the left, sucking gas out. Now it's not perfect. You know, we know landfills are the biggest uh, source of uh, methane. Um, but that's a pretty broad brush statement. Uh, as somebody that's on the ground doing stuff in my career, you, you have to really look further. And, and I think if we look over here, we'll find out that we have regulations that allow up to two years to, to put in those systems to collect the gas. A lot of gas gets away while you're doing the daily sales and intermediate covers and all that. So, so we're going to address... Uh, a way to perhaps deal with that, as well as the, the long-term one that, on, where the gas system's already there, but not good enough. Uh, so let's identify the interim period as before wells are installed. We have a pretty high potential return on effort there because it's uncontrolled. Some might argue that you could even get greenhouse gas credits if you go after that gas because it's not under regulation. And if you go above and beyond, you get greenhouse gas credits, right? So um, we want to talk about an interim movable system because those landfill systems, landfill cells are moving around all the time. Uh, and I want to tie in beneficial reuse of desalination residues to retard the gas generation. Now you might say that's a retarded idea, Kevin. Like, what are you talking about? Let's get it out. Uh, bear with me. Um, in, in what I'm calling the future post-organic era, gas cells or gas wells, um, they'll be dilute. You know, you have an old landfill gas system that's running out and has to be supplemented with natural gas. I don't know if you knew that, but a lot of old landfills have to burn natural gas to keep the flare lit because the landfill gas is not enough. Likewise, for generators that make electric power, um, thin gas won't do it. So. While we do this great thing of diverting our organics from landfills, we're taking away the fuel for those systems that have been heavily capitalized. So we have to really look ahead here. Okay, uh, other ways to deal with thinning gas are, um, besides burning uh, fuel, is to make carbon filters. Uh, I had to do one of those on my little landfill in Bakersfield, but you burn coconut or something else overseas, you half burn it, make the char, bring it across the ocean, use it here. Maybe not the best GHG solution. Uh, fuel cell technologies, I've talked to some of those folks, they can use lesser amounts of gas and they're doing cool things like uh, microgrids at landfills, uh, small power loads like data centers and things. So I'm not advancing the only solution with what I'm gonna show you. I'm just saying, here's a way to maybe deal with it if these don't. Uh, so let's go back to our diagram. We've got the long-term and the interim um, to deal with. 
my potential new approach. Here we go. Um, we've got a greener system possible based on some past research. And I was really, really lucky to stumble upon this research. Um, oops, sorry, um, I gotta go back here. Here we go. Uh, fortunately, a uh, research team from UC Berkeley really caused the light bulb to come on in my head. Uh, they were studying carbon sequestration and not related to what we do at all. They are talking about growing biomass on purpose on waste, you know, on, on useless land and cutting it down and salting it away with salt to get that carbon out of the atmosphere, making a carbon bank. That's when I said, wait a minute, maybe we could do that with our garbage. So uh, a little greener system, if we use a little ingenuity, which uh, I call tinkering, we could come up with uh, some uh, equipment that is useful for, for moving around portably, like I said. Um, let's see. Biofiltration study. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, biofiltration, which most folks know about uh, to some degree, is where bacteria living on uh, a substrate or particles uh, will will um, eat up or or use up the bad molecules in the foul air. There's all different applications. Composting is one. We'll talk about that in the next show. Um, but uh, that's been studied to attenuate landfill gas. Uh, ironically, Cal Recycles Library has two uh, old studies, one under Governor Brown, one under Schwarzenegger, uh, trying to see if biofiltration would, would suffice for landfill gas control. The upshot was that it works for thinner gas, uh, but not so much for full strength landfill gas. Well, since those studies were done in kind of a full strength landfill gas era, I think they were maybe forgotten and we want to dust that principle off, bring it back. And, and then I'll get into the final part with this desalination residue thing. Um, we, um, we might find that that will actually bring the, um, the gas generation down a little bit and bring it within the range of biofiltration. Okay, so here's some pictorial. Uh, here's an example off a uh, color cycle study. Uh, you can see it's a lab scale project in the field. Oh, sorry, keep hitting the room. Uh, biofilters made with uh, methane passing through them had some pretty decent results. Here's the schematic of that, of that exercise. Um, you can see uh, the landfill gas has to pass up through an organic media and, uh, and it, it gets, uh, it's about a time and residency thing that the natural microbes will, will eat the bad molecules. Um, so um, with that schematic in mind, I'll, enter, I'll, I'll zero in on the one part of it. That's the lower half of that page from the study. Uh, so I want to give credit to those guys for uh, for that much work, but we're going to take it now into my shop and modify it. So the red lines represent some changes. First, we pick that box up and put it on wheels like a semi-trailer. We hang a blower underneath it. You can see a little square box. We have on board a water tank to supply our microbes with moisture. And we have on top solar panels to run the fan and the sprinkler system that keeps the microbes happy. And draping out from the sides, you've got landfill tarps. So I haven't done the hard engineering on this yet. I'm waiting for somebody to need a project. I'd be happy to help. But uh, I think we can get half an acre to an acre per unit, give or take. And landfill operators could move these around, uh, just tank up the water once in a while. And voila, you would have some portable methane attenuation on the surface of your landfill. You could move them to the hot spots. Uh, if, if, if it's not hot enough, you move it somewhere else. And our good friends, Chuck and Tom from yesterday that I've worked with on other compost projects, they would be the kind of brains uh, to count the molecules here and, and all that. So 
uh, I don't have all of that tech for you. Uh, this is another illustration of what a converted semi-trailer might look at or look like, uh, repurposed old semi-truck. Um, I didn't label it. You could probably get the idea. It's, it's a rolling biofilter you drape tarps out from, solar panels on top. Uh, let's see. We're doing on time. Okay. This, do not try to look at the fine print here. This is only for humor. It's a recipe card. Okay, so if I were to do a recipe for this system, here it is. And, I, and I'm gonna use that as a segue to, in some recipes you add a little salt, right? So here comes the salt part. We might wanna add a little salt or hopefully a lot, because remember we've got desalination to deal with our water problem in California and elsewhere. So uh, thanks again to the UC Berkeley team that, that prompted that thought. They said that, uh, food from the Roman Empire or Babylonian, or I forget which empire, is still edible today because it was salted away. That's in their study. And uh, you read a little further into other studies, you find that salt inhibits the, mo the microbes that make the methane. Uh, so I think we might have a, a beneficial use there. Um, and then I'm gonna bring in another little arm of the solid waste industry, the landfill industry that has uh, worked with bioreactor landfills. The bioreactor landfills are full of water pipes and air pipes. So you accelerate the methane as quickly as you can by getting it air and water. And, and the theory is to reduce, get the, the garbage to break down and result in more landfill space sooner so you can make more space and then you can harvest the methane sooner as well. It's an accelerated program. Um, there are some of those around the US, you've probably seen them, they're easy to look up. Um, but one of the hangups that I've seen in some of those uh, research papers is the second bullet here, uh, natural salt occurs or buildup occurs over time in that system and it, you know, it, they work, those bioreactors work, but it can be self-defeating because that increasing salinity from the water recirculating is counterproductive to forming the methane. So um, that can make the economics on bioreactors um, questionable. So let's talk about bioacceleration versus bioretardation. Let's slow it down. If we slow down the methane, first with SB1383 and all, cutting the food source from the microbes, great, good job. But there's still some organics there that are decomposing, still making nuisance methane. It's not long enough, or not thick enough to run flares and um, generators like we do today. So if we help it slow down by this other beneficial use, then we may have a really symbiotic relationship there and, and get that methane generation down to where the microbes in a biofilter can really handle it in the range of the two studies I mentioned in Cal Recycle and many, many others around the world have come to that same conclusion. Biofiltration is good for not too much methane. So uh, a bonus there is at the bottom, uh, that would be, if we control our landfill gas biologically instead of thermally with flares and engines, we have fewer criteria pollutant emissions. So there's another win for the air districts. Carb here. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> uh, so in summary, uh, the organic waste diversion effort thins the landfill gas. Thin gas won't run our conventional flares or power plants. Biofiltration has been found to attenuate methane at low levels. Um, past biofiltration efforts have mostly been site built, meaning put on the surface of the landfill. You can see lots of pictures of those. But if you know 1383 regulations, that won't fly with CalRecycle. <laughs> they don't want the organic material put on the landfill and left there. And I specifically argued for that in the draft regulations five years ago, <laughs> but they said no. So I'll put it in the box. We'll move it around, okay? We'll move it where needed and we'll get this job done. Um, 
Let's see. So that uh, and then the salts thing. Um, hopefully, uh, I, I don't have the science and tech on that yet. That, that's just an emerging concept here. Uh, research is going to have to be done. So the solid waste uh, industry in general may, may need to go in this direction. And then uh, at the last but not least, the uh, compost and mulch from these 1383 programs will have another market outlet if landfills need that stuff for filtration. It's another market, which we've been talking about in this symposium. So thank you for enduring on that crazy uh, idea. Uh, we'll see if it comes to pass. Um, we're going to have to really move quickly here. We have another 12 minutes. Yep. All yeah. right. Okay. Thanks. Switching presentations. Let's see. Two, two, three. <laughs> That's showing up? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's still on the other one. Okay. I'll do a new share and thank you okay okay uh that was good morning presentation this is good afternoon to talk through noon sorry to keep you through lunch but uh, the schedule ran late so uh in addition to being a lifelong garbage man uh i've learned to become a composter 30 years ago uh, i had to for ab 939 diversion so in my job at bakersfield we did a lot of composting, learned a lot. Um, and this is to identify a problem that's occurring that is, it's in the Central Valley, Southern San Joaquin Valley. Um, it, it has to do with air permitting, which is critical to compost facilities. And we know we need plenty of compost facilities to carry out the, the organics mission. I have clients that are stymied right now. They They've got everything lined up, ready to go, but they can't get a, an air permit. They could get the permit if they could throw millions and millions and millions of dollars at it for offsets, which we'll talk about here. Uh, so I might not stick to my bullets because I'm in a real rush here, but uh, let's see. So uh, this idea I'm gonna throw at you now is building upon the success that ACP with Dan Noble at the helm, uh, found back in 2012, we did a team project with CalRecycle and many others. When we thought the VOC regulations in South Coast Air and the Valley Air were going to kill composting, CalRecycle was petrified. We were all petrified. We're like, we can't build 100 acre buildings to put this in. It would kill the, the budget. So we got together and we did a great study then. We're going to build on that study for this new crisis, which I'll identify here. We're going to basically add a secondary control to that, that thing we did. Uh, as I said, San Joaquin Valley, although this could affect other air districts, uh, other air districts are concerned about VOC emissions. Uh, so talk to your local air regulator. Um, VOCs are compounds that are released into the air from composting. Most everybody knows that here. Uh, ERCs are emission reduction credits, also known as offsets. When you build something new, shopping mall, neighborhood, factory, whatever, most air districts make you offset the new pollution. So e ERCs and offsets are what has to be done there to keep no, no new net pollution, right? That's the, the principle. Uh, but we have um, this new problem that's occurred. I'll call it the mismatch between the federal and the San Joaquin Valley air standards, the, the way they did the banking. It began in 2020. Um, it's just methodologies and they had a congruency test and it didn't work out so well. And poof, 70% of the ERCs banked up in the valley were gone, they, they took them off the books. So that drove up the um, market price of those offsets, which businesses trade, just you know, like cap and trade. That drove them up 30 times over. Monday, I took the current pricing. So you can see it's a new roadblock to uh, compost facility permitting. Here are the prices I took Monday morning off the Air District website. $174,690 per ton of offset. They used to run 4,500 a ton historically. 
it's it's absolutely stopping um, new compost facility development in that in that air district, uh, except for um, Kern County Public Works Department was already moving along with uh, a little 100,000 ton a year facility at one of their landfills. And they were so far into the process, they went ahead and paid, uh, I think it's on my next slide, um, seven million dollars on the market for offsets to open that facility and and i say it's only a little 100,000 ton facility you know we need a lot we need like 100 of those in california right um so um that's the horror story now let's move toward the solution uh current voc control methods we're going to run through very fast here extra watering of windrows, micropore fabric, uh, the, the gore cover kind of thing, biofilter units, biofilter compost caps, uh, quick pictures of them. This water truck has double water nozzles added to control VOCs. That's an air district thing. Not so good for the drought, but it's a way to get by. This uh, is micropore covers are very effective, of course. Uh, this is schematic or or a simple diagram of uh, more advanced biofilters that may push or pull air. Um, you've seen these around the industry, I'm sure. And then you've got this uh, old diagram from the 1980s, which we dusted off. And this was the heart of the study that we did 10 years ago. Uh, this is the compost cap uh, diagram. So we're gonna focus on this. Remember, this is little air blowers blowing in through a perf pipe. Um, I've got one minute. <laughs> Why are we, what, these have to be because, well, offsets have to be, okay? Uh, here's the example of some math. If you go better than that, oh, all those methods I showed are backed best available control technologies. They're all recognized by the Air District to, at about 80% VOC control. Well, they really are clocking in about 90% control. So if we say 90% at a new facility for one of those systems that we just showed, 100,000 ton a year organic composting, let's do the math, come down to the yellow, it's 15,800 pounds of VOC offsets needed to open that facility. Well, let's put that in, in the pre-2020 average market of $4,500 a ton versus today's. And you can see that the cost is ginormous. So uh, yeah, it makes composting unaffordable right now for new composting. And that goes for existing facilities expanding capacity if their air permit doesn't already have it or for new facilities. So this is a big, big problem. Um, so we're ready to add uh, some Home Depot engineering, as I call it, uh, to make that situation better. Here's a picture from the 2012 project where we literally laid Home Depot pipe on the ground for the pilot. We had the solar panels and discovered the VOCs could, you know, uh, get controlled by the bio filter cap. Uh, that diagram again to keep fresh in your mind. This is uh, uh, borrowed off the internet. This illustrates a positive pressure one on the right. That's the thing I've been talking about. On the left is a negative air pressure, uh, one where it's sucking air in through the cover and out through a small biofilter in the lower right. Everybody see that? That's important, but we're gonna hybridize this thing. Uh, I'm always trying to take a square peg and whittle it down and fit it in a round hole to get a job done. So if we take our stock program or approach with that biofilter gap pictured here, and now we, uh, we got out the red marker and we put some uh, flex perf pipe over it so we can collect air off the top. And we take a green marker and we put a regular tarp, a cheap tarp, not an expensive micropore tarp, very cheap tarp over this, like think dairy, dairy silage covers. Um, we have now captured the 8% or so, 10 or 8%, of the VOCs that we're getting away from our biofilter cap. We're gonna duck them out through the red pipe. And we can put a little biofilter right next door to it. 
and send them through there. Now this is conventional biofilter with what we call updraft. The air goes in the bottom, the foul air goes through the wood chip uh, media and comes out cleaner. So that's a way of polishing and getting way better than the 92%. But there's a hitch. And I love my friends, Chuck and Tom from yesterday, the air testers. Here's one of Chuck's flux chambers. Uh, that's expensive. I, I don't want to put them out of any work. In fact, I'm trying to make more work for them on the landfill thing I just talked about. But this stuff's expensive. Um, so I've got a way to maybe mitigate that cost. And that would be to take this diagram, which you just saw with the updraft conventional biofilter, turn it upside down, some more flex pipe and tarp from the Home Depot, and we'll turn it upside down, run the air down through it and out an exhaust pipe. Air district people say that's genius because now you, you put your meter in a tailpipe like your smog test on your car. You're not doing the expensive flux chamber test. So this could be really cool, it needs to be tested out. Uh, so yeah, the pretty much bullet points to say what I just said. Going forward, um, the San Joaquin Air District has had public meetings asking for all industries to come forward with VOC control ideas. They need it to keep the Central Valley developing because development of all kinds of projects may be stymied from that shortage we talked about. Uh, testing is needed for this solution. Uh, sadly, the San Joaquin Air District didn't have the grant funds. On behalf of my friend Dan at the association, I checked in with them and we, we were hoping for a reprisal of the other grant, but no dice. Uh, now, this is important. The first facility that implements something like this might be able to bank offsets because this is going above and beyond backed now. I don't, don't take me for sure on this, but uh, usually the first kid on the block gets the credit and then it raises the backed level, which, which may happen. That's what happened kind of with the other story 10 years ago. Uh, but most importantly, if we can pull this together and get the industry going this way or, or some other way, if somebody's got a better idea, then we can remove the roadblock to compost permitting and keep going with our 1383 progress. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's summarize and let you go to lunch. Uh, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Hopefully you can read the, the bullets. And uh, here you are. If you'd like to look me up, feel free. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Okay, uh, we are going to do a little question answer and I'm gonna unshare this. Um, I think we're there and I'll turn off video. And just two that unshared yet. Oh. Stop share. There we go. Cool. Um, thank you both for the presentations. I really like a lot of the out of the box thinking and uh, discussions that were uh, taking place just within your slides. Um, I don't think we have uh, online questions as of yet. Um, so I'll start with anyone in the audience. Um, and we have one uh, loaded up with the green microphone live, so ready to go. Hello, uh, Michael Cohn from uh, UC Cooperative Extension, Santa Clara. Uh, that was really exciting. I, I enjoyed that a lot. You're taking a, what's seen as a waste, like that that brine and turning it into a resource, right? I mean, that's what it's all about. And, um, you know, in the same regard, uh, so so thinking of that biofilter, you know, it's, uh, you're, you're, you, you are um, putting the, the, the methanes coming up. You have methanotrophic bacteria that are using that as an energy and carbon source, right? And it's coming up. Um, and they need something to deposit the electrons on, uh, electrons on, and that's why you're putting, you're pumping air in there, right, to to give them the air they need. Yes, they need oxygen. Yeah, 
Um, one possibility is, uh, you know, thinking of another waste uh, or, or pollutant in Central Valley, you know, nitrate, that can substitute for oxygen with certain uh, methanotrophs. And, um, you know, the idea of perhaps trickling, you know, you just using the, the water that's uh, present already and polluted with nitrate. Uh, and that, even if you're putting oxygen in there for the micro anaerobic zones, um, it can serve as electron acceptor. Yes, uh, let me make a comment on that idea. <clears throat> that would be outside the scope of this, these two presentations. But uh, our firm has worked on a couple of projects in the Southern San Joaquin with uh, nitrate laden water and wood chip media uh, coupled with vermiculture. Mm -hmm. There's a firm known as Biofiltro. You can look that up yeah. on the internet. And uh, uh, so far, it looks like very successful uh, progress on that. So I, th I think that's more along that line. Uh, yeah, I mean, even for your sister, your your system uh, for you know removing methane and the, the nitrate can serve uh, something there. And and uh, also you, you mentioned that uh, having the organics there as the substrate is not really possible on a, in a permanent biofilter. You have to have it in a mobile system. Uh, have you considered just using something like uh, new packs, these uh, high surface area plastics uh, as a filtration medium? Yes, I did. Uh, for everyone to know, uh, biofiltration can be accomplished on any kind of media. Mm -hmm. um, glass beads, plastic balls, wood chips, just so long as there's a moisture film for the bacteria to live on. Um, I thought about granular plastic because in the solid waste field, uh, recycling challenge, we have a lot of unwanted plastic that mm -hmm. is unfortunately landfilled. That's another no-no for Cal Recycle regulations to put that on the landfill. I already tried that. Uh, but if we put it in a box and make it mobile for the landfill operator mm -hmm. to be able to move it to the hot spots and as working faces relocate constantly at landfills yeah. in the two or more years before the really gas extraction systems go in, then yeah, that, that could be. Um, so yes, inorganic media for biofilters by all means. Uh, more tailored to this group, I would use the, the wood mulch because we've got biomass that needs a home. I, yeah, so it makes sense irrespective of the, of the regulation, just have it mobile. Yeah, gotcha. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, excellent question. Now we have a question too in the audience. This one's for Dr. McCullough. Mike, I'll, I'll take you to task on a point. Um, the material that the air burners produce, I uh, wouldn't call that borrowed char. It tests out as just basically ash. And it really confuses the industry when that, those systems are marketed as a system that not mm -hmm. only can very, very cheaply burn the wood, but makes biochar. And I find that really um, bad marketing, first of all. So I wanted to kind of clarify that, see your thoughts on that. Um, have you dealt with the, the characterization of their product versus a good standard of biochar. Yeah, no. be careful with that one. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I know we saw biochar being produced from, from pyrolysis system that was really high standard and, and, sure. and beneficial and and definitely compared to the, the stuff coming off in an air curtain burner. Uh, you could tell the difference just by looking at it. And that's not my yeah. area of expertise, but that's a good point. Um, so then, so then the idea of its actual beneficial use with soil incorporation would be different. I guess that's the point you're making. Yeah, it's yeah, it's great, yeah, cheap. Yeah, right. but um, they're marketing the the systems, which quite a bit, and the Forest Service really likes them. Sure. Uh, to put them into place because they are cheap and they're very portable. Sure. But uh, unfortunately, they started off their their marketing on those systems with the idea that that's a biochar production unit, and I'd contest that. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Mike uh, and Kevin, excuse me, but uh, uh, just a comment on that from my other experience uh, managing a lot of uh, wood, wood waste. I studied those units when we had what Cal Recycle called wood again in 2015, mm -hmm. when our biomass plants closed in the valley. And uh, to my understanding, 
the way the floor and the drag chains and such are, the equipment is constructed, you can produce more what's clinkers, you know, those, those chunky pieces of charcoal from one particular brand that I studied mm -hmm. versus a couple other brands that, that didn't do that, that were more ash based. So uh, I don't know which companies said what, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them can be adjusted, but by and large, they produce ash rather than by a very, very high end ash that you, you want to be very careful in use in soils amendment. In some uses, it's good. Some, some places you can use that kind of an ash, but you better know what it is. So I didn't want to make a big sore point on it, but there, there is, it's difficult in working with pyrolysis and biochar enough without being it, having it be confused with the production of uh, an ash product like that. And from my little experience in this arena, I feel like I hear so many of these conversations and the, uh, with, with, you know, quote unquote biochar, um, it would be amazing if we had kind of a tiered labeling system to be like, this is this style and the positive negatives. I mean, it was hydrophobic and hydrophilic and now what? Oh, exactly. The, the audience member was saying, I've been working on it for years and it would be amazing if we made uh, progress in this arena. Uh, so we have uh, Mike Wad, I wanted to have a quick question. Hey, this question is more for um, Professor McCollin, is that correct? McCollin, Like yeah. along with long thermal chemical, um, it's interesting we're already going this direction of the thermochemical discussions. Mostly just wanted to ask yourself or anyone else uh, present, you mentioned, uh, what was it, five beneficial pathways in your uh, economic discussion. Mm -hmm. And you said that the uh, biomass controlled combustion for power was a pretty good pathway, but is being phased out. I always love to learn more about why those are all being phased out. I, unless anyone else can answer this more appropriately, but that goes back to the, the, the what, what did you say? What was it? Wood again, or what it was in 2015? So when a lot of these these places shut down, I, I believe it was because of, I don't know, um, reductions in state um, subsidies and fundings. I I think that's that's about what it was, but. Um, but I can't remember exactly. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll take a crack at that again yeah. from uh, my, my horrible experiences. Uh, the biomass plants, and mind you, I used to send my job 200 tons a day of biomass to energy uh, in Southern San Joaquin uh, for many years, and then suddenly it shut down. Why? Uh, first off, the major utilities buy renewable energies for their renewable portfolios, which are increasing in California from legislation. But let's go back a few years, they, they weren't. Well, from the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, the green energy for those portfolios was wood-fired biomass. Mm. Okay. Those plants were the smog control uh, system for the fruits and nuts grown in California to feed the world. Those biomass plants were the smog control for that. And so the, the utilities used that and call it green. Well, but then along came solar, which was heavily subsidized. And coincidentally, or concurrently, those plants are like the old steam locomotive in the movie. You know, they can only go so many years and they have to get rebuilt. Well, if you rebuild a $50 million power plant, uh, you know, to do the same old, same old, at that junction, they weren't having the power purchase agreements. Solar was taking its place. And, and there we have it, our wood was homeless. We've got, I think on top of that too, right? We have, we've, we're importing a lot of biodiesel now, right? From, from deep stocks from out of state, which is taking a part of that portfolio. Great, thank you both. That's basically what I've been seeing is it's a competing subsidy, competing incentives and they've all somewhat moved on. But we're now, I believe, starting to see the consequence of really no substitute technology for the significant amount of lignocellulose-based material that is overwhelming. Yes, uh, comment, please. Uh, in that, 
would again aftermath <clears throat> at my facility in Bakersfield. I had the air district behind me, Cal Recycle behind me, Cal State Bakersfield behind me. We had we had a great team, and we entertained. I drove I don't know how many places on my own time to visit plants and vendors, trying to find the one that could do something with wood, pyrolysis or gasification, that we could permit in the Central Valley. We came up with this many, and, and we were ready to incubate. Our facility had the fuel for them, the space on the token lease. We had the electric load on site because we used the power. We had every, if there was a dream site to do that, and we could not do that because of emissions. So, challenging. Thanks. All right, I think uh, there's one last little comment uh, before we break for lunch. Uh, Hossein, who's been um, manning the amazing uh, Zoom puppet mastering, uh, he actually mentioned in the chat um, that there's an open access project hosted by UC Davis um, regarding the biochar thing we're talking about. Um, and their soil chemistry lab, um, the Pyrick lab, um, that has a database of biochar and properties. So I am assuming many people are, are working on the, the biochar kind of qualities and categorizations uh, issue that we brought up earlier. So that's one bright light in a, in a big uh, task in, in future for that one area. And um, thank you to Kevin and, and Professor McCullough for um, laying out a lot of uh, really interesting uh, concepts for everything from you know, the uh, most expensive, uh, the highest expensive first mile, last mile, uh, marginal cost being so important, bang for your buck. Um, obviously, a lot of negative and positive externalities that need to be brought into the equation um, better. Uh, no one size fits all, which uh, previously the zero food print uh, touched on on that a bit. Um, and we need to, it sounds like we need to, to push that even to a larger uh, scale. And then uh, for Kevin, obviously, a biofilter is a huge potential. And then um, your uh, innovative kind of, Home Depot, uh, you know, reversing the airflow and static piles with uh, cheap covers. Um, that's awesome. I would love to see that taken up somewhere. So. Hello, hello, okay.
Yeah, I guess so.
Nice yeah, it'll be at the end. We'll leave questions. Oh, she's remote. Yeah. Yeah. She plans to be here, but uh, I think she's getting COVID. Oh. Oh, we're coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you think oh, no. She's going to be remote. Yeah. yeah. Okay. She probably has COVID, so oh, she's doing remote. Oh, okay. So then somebody can hook her up. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then she can. Yeah. Uh, should I go ahead and introduce her? Uh, well, Mark is first. Um, well, I was just going to um, introduce, introduce. Yeah, then she's a moderator. I'm the moderator. Yeah, oh, Hussein yeah. is stepping in oh, as okay. Okay. the oh, in person oh, round. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we're just uh, getting rolling. But that's not the talk over there. Uh, well, I'll, I'll stop oh, it. Yeah, we'll start the session with that. I'll stop sharing and it'll go. Oh, to I see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to get started uh, with session seven on. Um, this will be moderated by Hossein Adalati, who's a, a PhD student at UC Davis working on organic residuals issues. Thank you, Lauren. Um, uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming back after lunch for those who are online and in person. Um, uh, we have three presenters for this session today. Um, we'll have the Q&A at the end. Online um, participants just know that you can use the Q&A feature to ask questions if you um, have them. Um, I will begin by introducing our first presenter, Dr. Mark Maskell, professor from the UC Davis Department of Chemistry. Um, Dr. Maskell received his PhD in synthetic organic chemistry from the University of London and has worked in the laboratories of two Nobel laureates. He started his academic career at the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom, from which he moved to the US to take up a visiting professor to take up a visiting professor of chemistry position at UCLA in 2000. He was then appointed assistant professor of chemistry at UC Davis in 2003, advancing to full professor in 2011. He was named the 2012 Fulbright Distinguished Chair in Alternative Energy at Technology at Chalmers University of Technology in, in Gothenburg, Sweden, and was the 2021 National Academy's Jefferson Science Fellow in the US State Department. Most recently, he received a 2022 Environmental Protection Agency Green Chemistry Challenge Award. The major thrust of his research program is in sustainable chemistry, specifically the upcycling of waste biomass into platform molecules that can be used to access a range of biofuels 
re renewable plastics and green replacements for petrochemicals. He also has interest in conducting organic materials, pharmaceutical chemistry, computational modeling, and fundamental aspects of molecular structure. He is involved in startup companies spun off from intellectual property, property that originated in his lab in the areas of sustainable production of recyclable plastics, cardioprotective supplements, and therapies to combat, to combat refractory epilepsy. One of the companies that licenses technology from his lab, Origin Materials, has recently become the first publicly traded carbon negative materials company. Welcome. Do I have uh, five more minutes to? to uh... Because we've uh, taken these five minutes, or uh, do I oh, start? Uh, yeah, just simply. Yeah, you'll yeah. tell me when. Okay. 20, 20. Okay. Thanks very much. And uh, uh, it's good to be here. It's uh, this, this looks like a great meeting. I, I didn't see some of the earlier talks, but uh, uh, this is uh, certainly something that we got to be talking about. And the good question uh, is why do we have to be talking about this, right? That's kind of hard to see there, but uh, maybe you can see it online. That is a raging uh, fire, and we need to know really what are our motivations. And uh, this is, of course, a picture from California where we know about it feels like half the state burns down every year. And um, we uh, certainly now have good evidence that climate change uh, is responsible for this. And uh, this is a very interesting tool. So uh, as was mentioned, I, I worked... Uh, with the government uh, for a year uh, and in the State Department as a policy advisor in uh, the area of sustainability. And they introduced me to, to this uh, tool, the En-ROADS tool, which is a collaboration from Climate Interactive and, and MIT. Uh, and basically it breaks this down into a, a bunch of different parameters. Uh, and there are these sliders uh, and it looks very simple. The front end is very simple. There's a lot of science behind this, of course. And, and if you look at the status quo where we're in now when it comes to energy supply, transport, buildings, growth, land, et cetera, use, carbon removal, you see that by 2100, we would have a 3.6 degree centigrade uh, increase in, in global temperature, which is, of course, I think we would all uh, understand to be untenable, right? So I've taken the liberty of moving these all to their most favorable possible positions. So uh, no, coil, coil, no coal, no oil, natural gas, uh, high renewables, uh, and you can see high energy efficiency, uh, high afforestation, et cetera. And uh, what you do is of course you crash down very quickly and then by 2100, you're only at a one degree centigrade uh, uh, increase, uh, which of course is, uh, this is clearly what we have to be doing, whether we can, uh, make a break in the curve uh, quite this well, well, we'll have to see, but that's the idea. Certainly that's what I'm working towards and I know a lot of, a lot of you are too. Um, and just by way of introduction, you've probably seen a lot of introductions to, to the, these talks, but it's very important to put things into context. And one way of putting things into context is to look at the United Nations Sustainability Goals. And again, I've taken the liberty here of organizing these into a pyramid where the fundamental things here on the bottom have to be achieved before we get to these things here on top. So if we don't take action on the climate, if we, if we uh, don't deal with um, uh, water and uh, uh, all of the things here, life on land, life in the water, responsible consumption, uh, we're not gonna have good health and well-being. We're not gonna have zero hunger. Uh, we're not gonna have any of these things. We're gonna see poverty. And if we, if we don't have these things, all of these up here, which we care about a lot, especially here in California, equality, um, social justice, these kinds of things, I hope you don't mind me saying these simply will not matter anymore. Who's going to care about all of that if we don't have these things down here and we can't literally can't can't live the kind of lives that, that we're living. So this should be a powerful motivation for, for all of us, not only uh, environmentally, but socially uh, and, and economically uh, that we have to, to deal with. So here's my argument. I think this is a, a one that uh, we all understand that there's nothing wrong with carbon-based materials and fuels uh, as long as they are renewable. So we all have seen the cycle, carbon dioxide's pulled from the, the air into plants, uh, and then it goes back again through animals and plants and decomposition. And when you have this here, this is the big problem. So we're using uh, here in this plant, 
uh, carbon laid down in cycles thousands of years ago. Of course, that upsets the, the delicate balance, and that's where we end up in trouble. But if we continue to work only within this cycle, we, we would be fine, and that's the idea uh, of a carbon-based material. So what we're going to do is if we want fuels, we're going to use uh, uh, the carbon from uh, uh, natural sources to get it, and then the CO2 is going to go back, and the same with plastics and, and chemicals. All right, so where are we going to get this carbon? Okay, so uh, there are those that think that carbon dioxide, pulling carbon dioxide from the air, after all, there's too much carbon dioxide in the air, we need to pull it out, right? If we can pull it out, we can use it as a carbon source. Indeed, you can. Okay, you can pull it out, you can make methane from it, you can make carbon monoxide, of course, a very important industrial chemical. Um, there was once a, a book published uh, by a, a famous chemist, George Ola, on a methanol-based economy. So all of our materials, all of our fuels coming from methanol. Uh, or you can sequester it as, as carbon or put it into carbon materials. And, and, and indeed, there is a, a lot of uh, except, except exciting technologies coming from this, but why not use, this is my question, why not use the most concentrated form of CO2 that we have rather than trying to pull it out of the air? And that's agricultural, uh, forestry, and municipal waste. So ideally we're gonna use, we're gonna use biomass, ideally waste biomass, uh, but there are also energy crops. So miscanthus, this is like two meter tall grass. So this young lady must be at least two meters tall. So uh, no, a meter and a half tall maybe. And so this is like three meter tall grass. Uh, kelp is a, an exciting possibility, algae. Lots of work going on there. So either we're going to get it from waste or we're going to generate carbon uh, in other ways. But this, this is uh, where we're going to source the CO2, OK? So we're going to use biomass. And once you're using biomass, the question becomes this. How are you going to process it into uh, useful things? So there are basically three methods that are, are used. Uh, fermentative is the low-hanging fruit. This is something we're all familiar with. It's been around forever. It's based on two. Technologies that have been around forever, that's agriculture and sort of brewery, distillery type technologies. And that's great, okay? It makes compounds that are molecules that are, are familiar to us, that are grandfathered in and not, not so toxic, but it is slow, okay? There's no question about that. Uh, if you're making uh, um, specific materials from it, it can be expensive and you don't get 100% carbon utilization into the products. Of course, the bugs don't work for free. If you make ethanol, you're blowing out the same amount of CO2 as, as ethanol that you make. There are thermal methods, and we're all familiar with these. These are also sort of grandfathered in. They've been around for a long time. Uh, basically, we're going to heat something until it decomposes to give either gas or oil. But here you get complex mixtures. Of course, you have to upgrade since you get these wild mixtures uh, to, to, to have something that's really useful. And again, you don't capture 100% of the carbon into useful products. You get a lot of char. So what I'm going to talk about today is our work in chem chemocatalytic methods. And this basically uh, has to do with using the chemical catalysis that is used in the chemical industry now and applying it to biomass to make useful products. So this can be fast, maybe not as fast as thermal methods, but it certainly can be fast, certainly faster than fermentation. It can be inexpensive depending on your catalytic system. And you can capture 100% of, of the carbon into the products. So um, this is, you know, so this goes green. This is the greenest option for, for me. Okay, so this is a molecule called uh, hydroxymethylfurfural. So when we talk about the chemocatalytic uh, uh, use, utilization of the main biomass resource, which is, is cellulose, uh, or, or, or hemicellulose as well, uh, so the carbohydrate stream, uh, this is the thing that most people think about, certainly most people in my field think about. And you can get this in high yield uh, from fructose um, under aqueous conditions. You get variable yields from other sugars under certain types of conditions. Uh, but unfortunately, it's hydro hydrophilic nature and poor acid stability encumber its isolation. And therefore, it has had seen limited commercial production and no successful pilots from sugars other than fructose. So despite the fact that everybody's talking about it, this is what it gets from me, okay? This is not the way forward. And we started thinking about this and we, to cut a very long story short and a lot of years of research short, we settled instead on this molecule. Now this looks a lot like hydroxymethyl for LHMF, but this is CMF, so chloromethyl for L. So what about this? You can take sugars, 
or you can take cellulose, or you can take raw biomass. It simply does not matter which of these you use. If you work it up in uh, aqueous uh, hydrochloric acid environment, biphasic with solvent uh, under generally mild conditions, you get this in remarkable yield, okay? And the rest of it is levulinic acid, uh, which is also an important molecule. Uh, we call these platform molecules because they, they could sort of branch out like a tree and I'll show you that. Um, we get this in, in, in these two together in really very good yield. So CMF is a stable low melting solid. It is the functional equivalent and interconvertible with HMF. And, but product isolation is a simple matter of evaporating the solvent system, the solvents uh, layer that you use here. Uh, and indeed, this has been ported to flow systems that, re that reduce the reaction time uh, to minutes. So let's talk about this, okay? This, is, so this one gets a check mark instead of a, a stop sign. Okay, so CMF is a platform molecule. So that means basically like it's the trunk of a tree and it can branch out towards polymers, it can branch out, branch out towards fuels, it can branch out towards chemicals. Uh, and that's because if you look at it, it's got a lot of chemical versatility, okay? It's got a, an aldehyde group, it's got a chloromethyl group, it's got a furan ring. Uh, these are classic organic uh, synthons that you can use to make a lot of different things. So this is really pretty, going to be pretty useful stuff. And I, I hope that uh, what I tell you now will, will convince you of that, okay? So let's look at a case study here, right? So uh, this is uh, the company that was mentioned. Uh, uh, they are using uh, a patent from our lab to make CMF. And they were the first uh, publicly traded uh, sustainable uh, company, sustainable materials company. They call themselves the world's leading carbon negative materials company. Um, so I didn't write this. This is from their website, uh, and that's that's kind of kind of cool, uh, and um, really uh, uh, feels like uh, feels like the work, all the work we've done in our lab in, in this area is, is kind of vindicated when uh, when a, a multi million dollar company uh, comes comes out of it. So they originally went public with a I think a one point eight billion dollar eval uh, evaluation valuation, but that has since uh, sunk a little bit when reality sets in. Uh, but uh, they've got a, a, a pilot plant, and I'll, I'll talk about that, uh, that is working, and a commercial plant as well. Okay, so what is their technology? So they take CMF, and they hydrogenate out these two groups to give dimethylfuran. Uh, they do a cycloaddition reaction. I don't know how much chemistry you all know. I hope at least enough to know what I'm talking about here. Uh, this is made from ethanol, bioethanol, ideally, to give bioperizylene. And from that, you can make bio terapeutic acid. This is, is using an industry method. Uh, and terapeutic acid is, of course, the stuff that uh, is used to make PET plastic. Okay, there's another thing you can do is also you can oxidize this to furan dicarboxylic acid. And you see some similarity between these two. This has a benzene ring here, this has a furan ring here, but both of these are exciting monomers. Uh, this, of course, a uh, a renewable, bio-renewable uh, monomer, and th this is a, a totally new one, which is really starting to get some traction, okay? Uh, as I mentioned, used to make these, these kinds of bottles, uh, and Origin has partnered with these multinational corporations uh, to bring this to the market. So soon, hopefully, you'll be able to go to, to the supermarket, uh, grab a drinks bottle off the shelf that was made, uh, using technology that started in our lab at, at UC Davis. That's the kind of thing that gets me out of bed in the, in the morning. It's really quite exciting. This is their, uh, so they have a pilot plant here in West Sacramento. This is their first commercial plant, uh, that, which they built in Sarnia, Ontario. This is actually a very early picture. Uh, it's now complete and actually producing, uh, producing product. Uh, they have, uh, so that was origin one. This is origin two, cited for uh, Geismar, uh, Louisiana, a uh, construction I think is starting next year with commissioning in 2026. Um, they claim they have a, a more than $1 trillion uh, uh, total uh, addressable market. So um, it's exciting, who knows, Th things could still uh, go south, but uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that th this will uh, uh, not only uh, make a lot of uh, uh, royalties for my lab, but to bring a lot of uh, CO2 out of the in out of the air that would have been there otherwise. Okay, and here, this is the CEO, uh, and this is me and him uh, uh, receiving the uh, 2022 uh, EPA award for, for this technology. 
Um, there are other commercializations uh, that are, are happening. Uh, these companies here, uh, this one's making fuel. I'm gonna talk about fuel in a minute. Uh, this one's making fuel additives, XF. And this one's actually making um, a, a wellness product if you're in fatty acids. This is uh, Mercurius's pilot plant here. So a lot of stuff going on. Okay, so I've talked about uh, bio uh, PET and FDCA. Let's talk about uh, some other plastics and let's talk about sustainable aviation fuel. And I'll finish up with dyes uh, if I have enough time. So here is uh, CMF again, and here is acrylic acid. So this is another absolutely huge mainstream uh, monomer that's used to make a lot of materials. You've, everybody's heard of acrylics, right, of acrylates. And uh, what you do is you convert your CMF into levulinic acid. So this can be done. Uh, levulinic acid is also a, a, a product of the CMF process, but you can purposely convert it into levulinic acid. And from levulinic acid, you can do oxidations with hydrogen peroxide, and you can tune this based on the conditions. Under acidic conditions, you get succinic acid, which is also a useful molecule. Under basic conditions, you get hydroxypropanoic acid, which can dehydrate to a bioacrylic acid. So we have patents on this. Those, these have also been licensed, and we're hoping to also ultimately bring this up to uh, production. These things are slow. You know, why are they slow? Well, have you got a couple hundred million dollars that uh, you, know, you can put towards uh, uh, commercializing this for the first commercial plant? Most of us don't. Okay, so this is a tough sell, especially these days, but uh, we're, we're hoping to move forward with it. Um, so here is another uh, argument that we'll always need carbon-based fuels. Okay, and um, some, some people may dispute this, but are we really going to fly commercial aviation or even military aviation on batteries or fuel cells or, or those kinds of things? I, I really don't think so. I mean, there are, there are uh, airplanes that work on batteries, but, but not the kind that we need for serious, doing serious things. Agriculture is another thing. It has huge power requirements, okay, that you simply aren't going to easily do with batteries. Um, Trans-ocean uh, shipping, 4 million gallons of fuel uh, per crossing. 4 million gallons of fuel, that would be a lot of batteries. I think you would probably fill this whole thing up with batteries, right? So we're always going to need carbon-based fuels. And as long as they are used in a loop, okay, as long as they come from a sustainable source, there's no real problem with that, okay, at least from my perspective. Okay, so I'm going to go through a lot of, uh, of chemistry. If, if, if you don't appreciate the molecules, maybe at least appreciate the diversity of, of types of fuels that we can make. But here's CMF, and we can go in this direction towards oxygenates um, that we need for gasoline. Um, we can go uh, in this direction towards hydrocarbon fuels. Okay, this is a diesel additive. That's also a, a diesel additive. So the, these are either additives or fuels that, uh, that could be really quite useful for sustainable aviation fuel and gasoline. Okay, so I'm just gonna fairly quickly go through, um, I uh, hope I have enough time to fairly quickly go through some of the technologies. So CMF again to, to levulinic acid. Uh oh, I've lost my, um, I've lost my thing. Okay, that, that's no problem. Okay, it's back. Um, to levulinic acid, and then uh, to this uh, dehydration product, angel angelical lactone, which reacts with itself to give a dimer. And you see a lot of branching here, okay? And that branching ends up in the products when you remove all the oxygen. Now, why is branching important? Branching uh, is important because gasoline and aviation fuels both require highly branched hydrocarbons. You've got to have the branching there. If you don't have branching, you've got diesel fuel. Okay, and that, there's nothing wrong with diesel fuel, but the, these big markets, gasoline and aviation fuel need to have branched hydrocarbons. They're very hard to make from carbohydrates because carbohydrates are linear. So you got to find a way to get them together in such a way that you can introduce branching. So this is one way of introducing branching. Here's that same thing, angelic lactone dimer, and we're making branched products, but we're doing it using almost no external hydrogen, very little external hydrogen. How are we doing that? We're doing that Instead of reducing these highly oxidized groups, we're just getting rid of them, okay? We're burning them out to CO2, okay? We're decarboxylating. And so all of that oxygen goes out as CO2, 
and we end up using very little hydrogen. So from biomass to something like this, we can get away with as little as one equivalent, externally equivalent of hydrogen. That is really pretty cool because hydrogen's an issue. Okay, here's lovulinic acid again from CMF. We uh, zap this electrochemically and we get a dimer, okay? And that dimer can be cyclized. And again, we get cyclic then cyclic branched products. I know I'm going through this really fast. Uh, if you want to know more about the chemistry, um, we, can, we can talk about that offline. Um, another thing you can do with this levulinic acid here is a levulinic ester is you can dimerize it to the cyclopentadiene. And when you get rid of the oxygen, look at these things. Okay, this is really highly branched cyclic species with very high octane numbers, okay? Which is again, really pretty cool. These would be good for gasoline. Uh, another electrochemical method is using acetone. So that doesn't come from CMF, but I want to include it uh, because it's just because it's so cool and gives us cool products. So this is a fermentation product. So those of you who do fermentation, see, I, I don't hate fermentation. I don't dislike fermentation. I'm actually a friend of fermentation in, in this particular aspect, uh, but using the ABE fermentation, we get acetone. Um, you dimerize that, you zap it and you get uh, this reduction product, which dimerizes, uh, and then again, gives these really crazy, highly branched uh, products. So we did this, this is actually this stuff here. Okay, this, all, this mixture here, we looked at that and compared it to Jet A. And all of the things in Jet A, uh, this sample is at least as good, if not better. It has a higher density, that's great. It has uh, a higher, slightly higher uh, heat of combustion. Uh, it has a lower viscosity, that's what you want. Uh, it's got a lower freezing point, that's what you want. It's got a higher flash point, that's what you want. So in almost every way, well, in every way, it's at least as good, if not better than, than Jet A. You can put that in a jet tomorrow uh, and, and head off to Hawaii. Okay, so um, good. Uh, you also need oxygenates for, for gasoline. And I, I touched on this briefly on that first slide but you can take CMF and make these two oxygenates. This one has a high octane number. Uh, this one has a pretty good octane number too. So uh, there's a way to get all the components of gasoline just from, from CMF. Okay, and then the last couple of minutes, have I still got a couple of minutes? Oh, great, okay. In the last couple of minutes, it, not only it, CMF isn't just a pretty face when it comes to plastics and, um, and uh, fuels, we can also make industrial products that are uh, important like dyes. So we don't, don't really think about it, but, but look at all the dyes we use, okay? And they're all hydrocarbon, virtually all hydrocarbon based. And they're never recycled. How do you recycle dyes, right? And yet we use millions of tons of them a year. So these also contribute to the, the CO2 in the atmosphere when they decompose. So we've been looking at ways of making fabric dyes using CMF. And uh, you can do this uh, uh, from, this comes from CMF, uh, angelical lactone, we've already talked about, levulinic acid, we've already talked about. And you can get to these highly conjugated species, and this one happens to be kind of orangey, uh, and you can do your dyeing study here, which, which we did. Uh, we recently published, published this work, which I thought was really pretty cool. We hope to also uh, move into the dye industry here. Okay, and the last thing I wanna talk about, of course, you can't do what I do and not be really excited about uh, cellulose. So we do a lot of work with cellulose. Uh, and if you know about the isolation of cellulose, uh, it's a, a, a very dirty industry getting pulp from, from uh, wood. So we've got uh, 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 better ways than uh, to do that. Uh, some ways are using ionic liquids, et cetera, but these are expensive. Uh, and they're very difficult to recover. So the traditional way is dirty and chemically and energy intensive. The alternative ways that we've I developed so far don't really work all that well, so nobody really does them. So we've been working on a way uh, of doing this uh, using, I, I can't talk about it yet because we haven't really published it, but uh, a cheap uh, way of doing this with a, a recyclable medium. And here's the product here, and it doesn't even need, hardly even needs uh, bleaching. Okay, so that's really neat. We're also looking at nanocellulose. I'm not gonna talk much about that, but we've, we've looked at a, a new dispersion medium for nanocellulose. It's great to use, but it's hard to disperse. And we've published a paper recently about how to, uh, how to do that. Okay, so it only remains for me to thank the, the individuals involved, lots of people who've worked on this project, uh, lots of uh, places where we've gotten funding, 
uh, for this work. Uh, and thank you for your attention. This guy thanks you as well for, uh, mm -hmm. for your attention. Okay. Questions? Uh, we'll do questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to get Professor Zhang up um, and I will pre uh, introduce her in a minute. All right, Dr. Zhang, you can go ahead and share your presentation while I um, introduce you. Um, Roy Hong is a professor at the University of California, Davis. She's also my um, academic advisor. Um, she's a world-renowned expert in the field of bioenvironmental engineering and biological systems engineering. Dr. Zhang's innovative research and development in the field of bioenergy and bioproduct manufacturing and waste treatment has been recognized with many awards and has been widely reported by national and international news media. Dr. Zhang received environmental awards from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 2007, Achievement Award from the California Bioresource Alliance in 2013, and Clean Tech Innovator of the Year from Sacramento Regional Technology Alliance in 2014. She was elected as Fellow of the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers in 2016. And with that, um, please begin. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jose for a nice introduction and also moderating this exciting research session. And in my presentation today, so I wanted to talk about the nerve digestion, using a nerve digestion technology to convert the uh, food waste and the organic waste into biogas energy and about fertilizers. So a nerve digestion, it's a, a valuable uh, technology that has been uh, extensively used for waste treatment and it has become mainstream bioenergy generation technology for treating organic waste, especially um, those uh, waste material that are highly biodegradable, digestible, and uh, also have a high moisture content, for example, uh, food waste, uh, animal manures. And uh, so for um, the, uh, the presentation I have here today, so I wanted to uh, tell you about the uh, renewable energy uh, nerve digestion facility uh, operating on the campus of um, UC Davis. And uh, so the, with the benefits of um, um, and uh, diverting organic waste, especially food waste from landfill and producing biogas energy, and as converting a food processing and the food waste into um, biofertilizer products as well as energy. And so with a uh, lot of environmental, economic, uh, social uh, benefits. And uh, together, um, so this uh, um, approach and uh, those of us who working in you know, uh, using technology converting organic waste into valuable products that will allow uh, us to have this circular economy from farm to fork, back to farm. And so I want to tell you um, the neurobic uh, digestion uh, facility uh, operating on the campus of UC Davis. And also wanted to uh, share with you some research activities uh, uh, currently underway uh, at this facility. Again, this is a UC Davis Renewable Energy uh, Nerve Digester. So if you wanted to know a lot of details and the history and the current operation, and uh, so you can just go online and uh, uh, yeah, uh, search for UC Davis uh, Renewable Energy and Herb Digester, which is also called the REED. And then you'll be able to find a lot of information online. And this uh, facility was uh, originally developed in uh, 2014 by Clean World. There's a, a Sacramento-based uh, uh, bioenergy company. And so Clean World uh, worked with uh, UC Davis in partnership uh, with the private uh, investment as well as uh, um, some government public uh, funding. 
And uh, so um, then it was complete, this facility was completed uh, in January, 2014. That was uh, launched uh, um, in, on Earth Day in April, 2014. And it has been operational since then. And uh, this uh, facility uh, received the Biogas Project of the Year Award from American Biogas Council in 2015. And in the first five years, uh, Clean World uh, owned, operated uh, um, this uh, facility and treating uh, food waste ranging from 30 to up to 50 tons per day. And uh, so it's, uh, in the year of 2019, uh, approximately, Clean World transferred ownership to UC Davis. And so currently, read the facility is owned, operated by UC Davis. And since taking over, UC Davis has invested a good amount of funding uh, to upgrade, repair, upgrade, and also adding um, equipment to uh, work with the, yeah, work on the research projects. And so the technology used by uh, read the digesters are uh, high solids, Nerve digestion technology originally developed in my laboratory and it was commercialized. And so the, uh, the digesters are two phase thermophilic digesters. Thermophilic means that the temperature of the digesters are controlled at the, around 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And it currently has been uh, treating food waste and also fat oil grease fog. And our UC Davis uh, digester has made the uh, uh, great news and uh, was made uh, to Jeopardy. There was $600 question. And uh, so um, in, in 2020, UC Davis converts 50 tons of organic waste into energy daily with a system called AD. And so, um, and, uh, uh, so basically, uh, this is a great uh, PR, and we need the uh, positive, great uh, yeah, PR news to um, spread the words and educate the public. And uh, this is a uh, how uh, our UC Davis Reed Digester look like if you're walking today. And uh, so um, there are five, there are four tanks. The three tanks in the back are digesters. And uh, the tank uh, in the front uh, is for storage of, of uh, digestate. Okay. And uh, uh, material come in, feedstock come in, processed over here, and then put into these uh, digesters. And uh, uh, initially, um, the facility was designed to have three uh, digesters and this was the first phase the second phase and also there's polishing tank and uh, in the past the year or so and uh, this first tank was down and is being repaired so current currently and the feedstock uh, is uh, pumped into the first uh, the tank behind this one and uh, so um, broken down converting into old fatty acid then uh, transferred into this larger tank. That's where the methanogens are housed uh, and uh, converting water fatty acid, the uh, organic acid into biogas. And uh, uh, you see the pipeline connecting to, to, to these digesters So that pipeline collects the biogas and uh, passes through heron sulfide scrubber and also um, and the carbon scrubber and then, so the biogas is ready for use uh, um, for uh, and yeah in, for electricity generation or can be readily combustible for heat uh, generation. And a two phase digester uh, basically has a two uh, uh, two digesters or two reactors connected. So food waste come in, put into this first phase is converting to uh, organic acids. And uh, depending on um, the type of material, 
And we got the mixture of world fatty acid and the lactic acid. Then these organic acid pump into the second phase and the uh, reactor designed as such. So we have high uh, density, high population of methanogenic uh, organisms uh, that efficiently convert organic acid into biogas. And the remaining material after digestion passing through a solid liquid separator to take out the solids and then uh, we'll have, we have digestate. And now we'll uh, show you the research uh, we have underway uh, converting digestate into fertilizers. Okay, um, here's a, a feedstock loading of reader digesters. And uh, so it includes the uh, food waste and also fog. And uh, here's, uh, so we're looking at the this uh, variable, so different amounts. So, so that's also the beauty of two-phase digestion. We're able to take in variety of um, material at the variable rate, but we still allow us still be able to control the second phase to uh, produce a steady flow of um, biogas. And uh, so food waste, uh, this uh, first column is food waste. Um, for example, last month, uh, uh, we fed digesters uh, about uh, 300 tons of food waste and 10,000 tons of fog. And uh, so then the fog uh, could go up to 20,000 uh, gallons per month. Okay, and then you wonder what type of food waste is, uh, uh, yeah, is loaded into digesters. And uh, it's a, uh, it have different types. And uh, the majority, 80, 85% of food waste loading to digesters uh, comes from um, a grocery store uh, distributor in Sacramento. And uh, so five days a week, and the trucks bring these produce waste and uh, so mainly fruits and vegetables, a little bit of meat and some ice cream. And uh, so then, uh, bring in and then we pre uh, process uh, the food waste uh, and take out the plastics, contaminants, and then grind the food waste uh, and uh, before pumping food waste into digesters. And uh, so each day currently with the two tanks and uh, about 10 to 15 tons of uh, food waste uh, of this kind is uh, fed into uh, the digester. And also about 10% uh, um, also food waste is uh, uh, is the food waste collected on campus of UC Davis. And you do see a lot of plastic, plastics here, food waste collected in the bags brought into the digester site for processing. And also occasionally a read facility uh, receives uh, loads of um, I, um, milk processing, dairy processing uh, waste. And uh, so um, that, that is a small quantity. And okay, so here's uh, the uh, front end of um, facility and uh, food waste is put in onto this pad and it's picked up, loaded into this machine. It's called the bio separator. Uh, what it does basically take the food waste uh, with the packaging material and uh, so and then break the package and uh, uh, spell, uh, yeah, um, take out the, the plastics, or some packaging material, those things we don't want it into the digester. And then food waste is ground up. This machine basically is a vertical hammer mill and with the pneumatic, pneumatic separation and air separation to separate the plastic-like material from the food waste. And then food waste grind up, collect the, uh, in the lower chamber and uh, some water added to it. Uh, so water comes from our digester, recycle the water, and uh, so then uh, mixed into pumpable consistency, and then material is pumped into the digesters. And uh, so this is what it looks like. And uh, uh, that, um, ground up food waste and it has a um, average about 27 percent close 30 percent of dry matter and uh, right so and uh, mainly it's great stuff and uh, highly organic and uh, bacteria microorganisms love it and digest converting to biogas 
Okay, and uh, here's uh, um, how the tank tankers so that bring in the fog, so for oil, oil, uh, fat oil grease, um, and uh, so each tanker bringing about five thousand gallons, and uh, so each month uh, this facility receives about ten thousand gallons or twenty thousand gallons. Uh, it varies depending on the amount available. Okay. And uh, so we do um, collect data uh, from our facility and uh, so including the feedstock loading. And uh, so we take samples when we have research grant uh, covering the research, we collect the um, samples to analyze solid content, the nutrients, and also has a, uh, in this facility measures about uh, gas flow and the methane of daily gas flow. And also we collect samples in the di from the digesters, so measuring uh, pH to solids, so water finding acid, alkalinity, ammonia, other parameters. So we monitor uh, the performance health of digesters. Okay. And uh, just some numbers uh, to share with you. These are uh, just the average uh, and in the past month in October, and uh, just to point out here, and uh, in the first uh, tank where food waste is loaded uh, and uh, got broken down into converted into organic acid, and has about thirteen percent of um, total solids, eleven percent of um, water solids, and uh, it's, it is a acidification reactor. pH uh, uh, rain, uh, is uh, between four and five. Normally, it's around the four point three, four point five. And the load fatty acid uh, is uh, 40,000 milligram liter. And since we uh, we feed uh, a lot of vegetables and fruits, so we do get a lot of um, lactic acid, around the 25,000 milligram liter. So together, load fatty acid, lactic acid uh, are um, uh, yeah, concentrated uh, with an uh, organic acid. Uh, and uh, so I see this is probably one of the few or the only uh, larger scale uh, facility where you can find the concentrated, the high concentration of uh, well water fatty acid than the lactic acid. So now we transfer these uh, um, acids into the second uh, uh, digester. That's where the uh, biogas is produced. And uh, so then the, that digester has a low VFA, so about 2,000 milligram liter. And uh, so normally range from 1,000 to 2,000 1, to 2,000 milligram liter. And ammonia is around the 2,300 uh, milligram liter. And uh, so you see this methanogenesis for biogas production. pH is uh, at neutral level and uh, normally at 7.5 up to 7.8. Okay. And uh, so the digestate is a great stuff. It has nutrients and has water, has a uh, um, healthy microbes uh, coming out of the digester, and uh, so it has a uh, close to three percent of the solids and uh, about three thousand milligram liter total TKN. And ammonia nitrogen is on twenty three hundred. Then it has phosphorus, uh, potassium, and uh, a bunch of uh, uh, micronutrients. It's great for use of, uh, for crop production as fertilizers. So, and uh, with the grant from EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, we added the uh, um, membrane separation and uh, behind the digester, basically uh, to separate the, the microbes, the fine solids from the digestate, the recycle some of the microbes back into the biogasification reactor so that we can increase the methanogenic population, increase the conversion efficiency. And also now after we separate the solids, the liquid fraction is um, put into ammonia stripping uh, system. And uh, that was recently added to our digester facility for extracting ammonia from digestate to produce a concentrated ammonia fertilizer. Okay. So, sorry. Here are the um, digesters. So this is where 
um, this is where ammonia extraction system is placed, and then this is where the microfiltration membrane separation uh, is a uh, equipment is placed. And uh, well, membrane, sorry, and uh, membrane separation is a is a for research project uh, is a pilot scale and basically testing out the, how good the uh, uh, membrane separation or how feasible practical membrane separation could be used for uh, recovering uh, recovery of microbes and uh, from the digest tape. And uh, so we uh, purchased the uh, microfiltration equipment from digested organics. And this uh, microfiltration system has a stainless steel membranes and which were uh, build the for this application for treating uh, wastewater and uh, for this in our case is digestate. Okay, so fully automated, and we spend about a hundred thousand dollars for this uh, piece, and it has been tested and used for treating digestate and performed reasonably well. And. So some data from the microfiltration system. And uh, so the flax, average flax, about 36 gallons per hour. And where we were have been running at 50% of separation and uh, reco uh, recovering the uh, retentate at a 50% rate. Uh, so then put it back into the digester. And ammonia extraction system. This is a new, and uh, this a whole uh, set of equipment that was uh, uh, put in with the investment from UC Davis. Uh, this ammonia extraction system was designed, built, uh, and also funded by UC Davis uh, and the uh, utilities uh, working in partnership with the uh, advanced uh, environmental methods. So that's a company that provides uh, the, uh, yeah, the technology equipment for ammonia extraction system. And uh, so ammonia extraction system has two processes. One is a steam distillation, and the second is a scrapping. And uh, so it's use a steam to uh, a perch uh, uh, digestate the two uh, voltage ammonia. And ammonia uh, is collected by uh, well, in well, in the scrubber and uh, uh, collected in, uh, with the um, acid solution. And acid could it be sulfuric acid or could it be organic acid like citric acid. Currently, um, uh, reed is uh, collecting with the citrate, uh, citric acid uh, to produce ammonium citrate as organic fertilizer product with the premium value. Okay. And uh, the system designed uh, to uh, treat the 10,000 gallons of digestate. And that digestate, uh, that, that's, that's the amount of digestate if uh, our digester is operating at the full capacity and uh, at the 50 tons per day food waste. And just quickly show you some photos. And uh, if you wanted to know details, please follow up with me. And also I'll give you the contact of uh, our management the team and uh, for a read. And uh, so um, so this uh, ammonia extraction system, it designed uh, with the feed rate of uh, about, uh, about the 15 gallons per minute and with the 4,000 uh, gram per liter ammonia concentration in the inlet, these are design parameters. And with expected over 90% of uh, ammonia separation recovery from digestate. And uh, this uh, um, uh, ammonia extraction system is uh, capable of uh, just taking the raw digestate uh, to uh, process or extract ammonia. Also for our EPA project, uh, we take a permeate after solids is, is uh, uh, separated, that we take permeate, the past permeate through ammonia extraction for ammonia recovery. Okay, and uh, here's a, sorry. And it has more yeah, data. So in terms of distillation column, temperature, pressure, again, and uh, without the 
uh, much time as I will skip the details uh, for uh, yeah for this equipment. Okay, so um, currently we um, are uh, working on our research project funded by EPA, and we continue to operate the test digesters, collect data, and especially uh, membrane separation for digestate the uh, treatment and ammonia extraction from the permeate after uh, yeah after the membrane filtration, and uh, so we're also in the process of modeling and uh, to perform economic environmental impact analysis uh, for this integrated uh, neurodigestion and digestate the treatment system. And so basically food waste uh, uh, come in, now we have a products, a biogas, and uh, biofertilizer products, biofertilizer concentrated uh, ammonium citrate, uh, and also uh, some concentrated uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah uh, fertilizers with the uh, recovered organic uh, material as well as the nutrients. Okay, so I just wanted to acknowledge Joe Yankowski, and the Joe is a manager for REED and also the research team from my department working with me on the EPA project and also uh, involved in other research activities at the uh, read the facility. And I wanted to um, thank uh, EPA for funding the research and also uh, uh, thank uh, UC Davis for providing a lot of funding support uh, to, um, yeah, to develop, I mean, have the redeveloped and uh, operational. And also we do provide a lot of education, outreach activities at the read. And uh, here's the contact information uh, for myself and also for Joe. And uh, so if you are interested in touring a read facility, especially if you have feedstock that uh, could be treated at the read and uh, Joe is looking for feedstock to uh, feed our um, hungry microbes. And also I wanted to share with you this YouTube channel from my lab, Bioenvironmental Engineering Lab. And in the, uh, yeah, in this YouTube channel, and uh, there's a lot of information uh, about our research projects in the past and the current, and uh, please check out our uh, research and presentations and also workshops. With that, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll have Dr. Cameron Patil Cow, who's uh, coming from uh, from the Department of uh, Plant Science at UC Davis. His research is focused on balancing crop production and sustainability goals in agriculture. Um, he's also joined by his PhD student, second year student in horticulture and agronomy, Valentina Roll, who did her undergrad in Uruguay. Welcome up. Yeah. I'll go ahead and start while he gets that pulled up, um, just because I know we're short on time. So nice to meet everyone. I'm Cameron Pittleco. I'm a professor of agronomy. I'm excited to be here because this is really a, a whole new world for me. I work on sustainability issues in production agriculture. Today, we're going to be talking about what is the value of using digestate as a fertilizer in production agriculture. So that's my interface with it. Uh, it was mentioned this morning, and I, I think I'm seeing that a lot in, in the discussions uh, so far is uh, I think we all, in order to make this bigger system work, we all need, need to be coming from our angle to say, where's the opportunity in my realm and how do we connect and make partnerships? Uh, so I really want to open that conversation uh, with, the, with the talk today. I will start us off for the first eight minutes or so. Valentina is going to share a bunch of her data in the middle, and then I'm going to wrap up at, at the end. Uh, so coming after Ray Hong's talk was perfect timing. She explained the whole digestate process. One thing I want to acknowledge, and, and many of you are probably aware of this, you know, there's all kinds of variability in what, what these systems look like and how they operate and what the feedstock <laughs> is, what's going in and what's coming out, right? So it took uh, a lot of conversations with Ray Hong to, to try and understand where can we pull from that stream 
take some of those nutrients and have that represent something uh, of, of a fertilizer value uh, in, in agricultural fields. So that's what we're talking about uh, today, mostly focusing, focusing on nitrogen fertilizer, as well as uh, the impact on soil greenhouse gas emissions. When we are trying to understand the greenhouse gas footprint of agriculture, I wanna break it down into these two categories because this is uh, really what we're trying to quantify in our field experiments. The one side is that nitrogen after water is often the most limiting uh, factor for crop production. So we apply a lot of it in our agricultural systems. Nitrogen is produced by taking nitrogen, uh, dinitrogen gas from the atmosphere. It's a very inten energy intensive process. So there's a huge carbon cost to that. Also, when we apply nitrogen fertilizer to soils, we stimulate uh, microbial uh, nitrification and denitrification processes that produce nitrous oxide, uh, a harmful greenhouse gas itself. So you combine those two things together and our addition of nitrogen usually represents somewhere between 30 to 50% of your carbon footprint in crop production. The second piece is soil carbon. If we are uh, managing our agricultural fields in a way where we are depleting soil carbon, that's an overall cost, and we need to add that to our footprint. Agriculture is getting a lot of attention for the potential to store carbon. So we can adopt practices that build carbon, but I do uh, want to be a little cautious about that. We heard a lot of um, speakers mention this morning about the carbon sequestration potential of soils. Everybody working in agriculture wants to sequester carbon in soils, but some of the scientists I know who've spent their whole career working on this are uh, quite skeptical about the feasibility and really putting all of our emphasis on that as the climate solution because there are limitations. So I just wanna throw that out there and we'll talk about a few of those in, in our talk. We approached digestate uh, as a possible uh, research topic because that seemed to be something that was not well addressed. Uh, I forgot to mention on my first slide, this is a CDFA funded project by the Healthy Soils Program. Most of the Healthy Soils dollars go towards funding farmers to adopt uh, practices that build carbon and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They do also support research, especially research aimed at understanding whether there are some other practices that should be added to their list of eligible practices to get incentivized. So this is one such project where there's been relatively more work on compost in California. Not a ton, actually, you'd, you'd be surprised, but more work on compost, much less on kind of the anaerobic side. Uh, and so we are trying to look at these three different pathways, specifically the uh, hydrolysis option, as well as the anaerobic digester option, and ask the questions, do we have soil benefits and do we have a greenhouse gas reduction? In my world, we can't assume that. We have to go out there, implement the treatments, and measure it and understand, is it going to work? How long is it going to take? What are the cost benefits to this practice? Uh, so we've already seen a lot of good slides today. I just want to introduce the, the kind of materials that we were applying in our study. We were looking at uh, anaerobic digestate solids. So depending on your digester system, you can have mostly liquids or solids or some combination, all kinds of possibilities out there. We uh, were using a uh, anaerobic digestate solid that is very similar to a, a compost product, uh, although it got to that end uh, uh, end state in a different way. And so this is kind of a high carbon, low nitrogen source. The second one here is our anaerobic digestate liquid. That was the picture we were seeing with Ray Hong. Uh, that is a high nitrogen, low carbon source. And then the last one uh, is actually more on the, the kind of high uh, carbon end, but not so much a stable carbon, more of a labile carbon. Uh, the hydrolysate would be kind of a, a microbial enhancer. Okay, that's, so that's to stimulate soil microbial communities that regulate a lot of these processes and, and the nutrient availability in soils and trying to, to um, make the best use of the, the in, uh, inherent soil carbon and nitrogen pools uh, that, are, that are sitting there supporting crop growth. Okay, so the, effect, uh, the big research questions for our projects, what are the effects of applying these materials on crop productivity? Uh, soil carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. 
I'm going to go over our methods for measuring those. Something that we're not addressing in this presentation, uh, but we are in the overall project over the three-year study is what are the impacts on soil health, economics, and uh, how much can we reduce our inorganic fertilizer inputs by applying these organic uh, soil amendments? Uh, pretty much these objectives match the research questions, although we're just talking about greenhouse gas emissions, crop yield, and this last piece of how much can we offset that inorganic and fertilizer input. Uh, so today I'm gonna to describe our first year of data collection from a three-year on-farm experiment. Um, the uh, methods used here, I see as really a first step in this direction. Okay, we have lots more organic materials that we expect to come into play. You can create really, um, nice concentrated fertilizer products from those, but it takes more processing. So we're saying, let's take the, the, the low hanging fruit here where we know the nutrients are in there uh, and apply them to agricultural fields. And we're doing this as a, a, a selecting crops in the rotation that are relatively low value, lower risk, uh, and only uh, applying a portion of our total end inputs and doing that at the start of the season, followed by soil incorporation. So this is kind of a short-term solution, recognizing in the long-term a lot more of these sophisticated processing technologies, uh, like the ammonia extraction uh, system that Ray Hong just described uh, are gonna be adopted. So our three sources in the experiment, going from left to right, we had the liquid and digestate uh, coming from Reed facility at UC Davis. We heard a lot about the, the properties uh, contained in that material. Uh, we, uh, the Yolo County landfill has recently completed and, and built a relatively large anaerobic uh, digester system. So we are actually pulling dry uh, digestate solids from that. That's our middle screenshot there. And then on the right, we are using a commercial hydrolysate product uh, with the idea of relatively no, low nutrient content, but the idea of having labile carbon to, to stimulate uh, microbial, microbial activity. I want to acknowledge a lot of collaborators on this project, especially